Shalom Chabarim, Shalom, Shalom Rastafari Chabarim, and greetings, greetings, greetings to all others checking out this particular vlog video. This is Ras Ayadonis Tafari of the Lion of Judah Society, L-O-J-S dot O-R-G. So here, 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 been asked our perspective, view, the biblical teaching, biblical genetics, DNA, concerning the so-called white man so-called white man is the white man Esau is the white man not Esau so we came across this particular meme here and I'm going to use this for a point of reference as an exhibit that the white man is not Esau or Esau the white man is not Esau however the white man is under the curse right the curse we even call the global curse but the curse of Esau, but the white man, so to speak, is not Esau. Now, here it says the One West Camps, stop lying. Now, One West Camp, speaking of the 1970, the 70 AD, or should we say the 1970, 70 AD, we can say the latter day um, Israelites, or the Israeli School of Universal Practical Knowledge, also known as the Israelite School, of universal practical knowledge ISUPK so we do agree that the so-called white man and this particular world system today's world system the world system that we see we're in the times of the Gentiles the times of the Gentiles refer to the times of the nations or the times of the nation states so those who are not too familiar with this terminology, nation states, please look up and do your own research on the nation states. Biblically speaking, the nation states are the Gentiles and the times of the Gentiles are the times of the nation states. So we live in a world today which we don't really use the term kingdom so much unless the ruler is a king, so forth and so on. But the terminology in the Bible, scriptural terminology, we have nation versus nation, kingdom versus kingdom. The kingdom refers to the government. But when it speaks of the times of the Gentiles in the scripture, it's a time of the nation states, the other nation states other than called Yisrael, other than the children of Israel. And that includes us, we, the black Jews of the lion of the tribe of Judah, the tribe of Yehuda. We over here in the Americas and the Caribbean and also scattered to the other corners, the four corners of this earthly plane. Because the earth is not a planet, a planet is a wandering star, the earth is a plane. Both a, we could say a phi cycle, a physical plane and also a metaphysical plane. But on this particular plane of reality... The white man is not Esau, is not Esau, but he is under the curse of Esau. Now, people say, well, wh why do you say that? You said the white man is not Esau, but he's under the curse of Esau. So what's the curse of Esau? That's a good question if you ask. What's the curse of Esau? Curse of Esau, we can go to um, Obadiah, Obadiah, uh, the prophet Obadiah. And we have it right there, one chapter, just check it out, one chapter right there. This is just a kind of an overview since this question has come up. And we have to do our own like FAQs, like frequently asked questions, right? So we, the black Jews of the lion of the tribe of Judah, the tribe of Judah, we Rastafari Yehudim, Rastafari Jews, and I and I, Right? We do not advocate that the white man is Esau, but the white man is under the curse and under the dispensation of Esau. In fact, Esau is the head of the nations. His spirit, his ideology, his philosophy, his idolatry is the head of the nations, is the head of this world system the head of this world system but as far as Esau now Esau Esau has a lot to do with the so-called white man we could say proverbially speaking or more than a proverb in that sense but it's an actual reality that they're all in bed they're all in bed 
both being in bed together and embedded and embedded together two different terminology one being in bed like a lot of people in the same bed and also embedded right embedded so there's a lot of super imposition right both in the sense of the genetics right the genetics and we could say the biblical dna now if we go to the scripts, we can begin off with Esau, Esau in the beginning. We can begin off with Ribka, Rebecca, and that word of prophecy concerning the two, the two manner of people, right? Those two sons, the two manner of people in her womb. And we also can, as we continue the narrative in Bereshith, in Genesis, the first book of Moshe, of Moses, the Hebrew book that in English is called Genesis from the birth of Esau and then we can read what is said concerning him prophetically as well as with the blessing that particular blessing now Esau Esau lost the Braca that blessing because he had sold his Bikor or his birthright the birthright in the culture of the east and the culture of the hebrews right and of that particular ancient ancient region of the world the birthright one's blessing first of all one's blessing one's baraka is connected with one's birthright so depends on the order of one's birth came forward one's blessing so the firstborn, naturally speaking, would get that, we could say that, that lion's share of the birthright. But we know that Esau, that Esau, of his own free so-called will, as free as free will can be, he sold his birthright, right? And therefore, by selling his birthright, being the primogenitor, like the first, the primo, Right, he became second in the proper and the true order of the baraka of the blessing. Now, ones you know, ones might go into that particular chapter there and say, Oh, well, you know, um, um, Isaac and 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 Jacob and and Rebecca, oh, there was a deception going on, so forth and so on. But when we start to put things in their proper order, we see that it was Isaac that prayed for Rebecca, Rivka because Yahuwah, because Hashem, Jehovah had closed her womb. So he prayed for her to, to conceive. She conceived and she brought forth twins. And while these twins were in her womb, she was experiencing their wrestling, their fighting and their wrestling in her womb. And she was like, if I be like this, you know, like what, 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 what? And according to the scriptures, first book of Moshe according to Bereshith she went to inquire of Yahweh HaKadosh Baruch Hu Baruch Hashem of the Holy One blessed be he blessed be the name she went to inquire of Jehovah and to her Jehovah or the the Gentile tetragrammaton <laughs> Lord the Lord basically told her note check that it was Jehovah who told Ribka. It's very interesting. Yitzhak, Isaac, he prayed because his his wife, his Isha, his Eshet, Oset, his womb man, her, her womb was closed. Right? And he prayed for it to be open for her to conceive. His prayer was answered and we get these twins. Right? We get Esau and Yaakov. And Esau or Esau and Jacob are wrestling in her womb. And as they're wrestling in her womb, she started to question that. And according to the scripture, she went. I'm emphasizing this right here. She went. Because a lot of people like to speak about, oh, sexism and feminism and isms and the isms and the schisms. And But let's go to the, the evidence. The evidence clearly shows that it was Ribka, Rebecca, according to the scripture, according to what is written, that went to inquire of Yahweh, 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 went to inquire of Jehovah and he revealed to her, to she, this prophecy. So, as we continue the narrative, she is guarding that word of prophecy and doing that which is in her power and ability to see to. In fact, 
in the chapter where we have Yitzhak and the and the and the burkot and the blessings, right? And the blessing that some would say, we don't say, but some would say was stolen. No. Esau, Esau was seeking to steal the blessing because he had already sold his birthright. He already was, was kind of hiding a lie. This, this lie was known to, of course, the one he sold it to, Jacob, and also was known to, Rivka, to Rebekah, their mother. Now, according to that particular chapter in the scripture, this is, you know, we're going over just some basic, some basics right here, because this is important to understand and to get a good understanding and come to overstanding of why the white man is not Esau, is not Esau. In other words, Esau was not the so-called white man, but as a Hebrew, we could say parable as a proverb, as a point of reference, when we look at the nature, the spiritual nature, the white man is under and is controlled by that spirit of Esau. See, Esau, Esau is the head, right? Esau is the head in what he is the head of. You see the two, the two children, I'm getting the scripture right here so we can go to the scripture right here. Cause we were just, going over some of the basics but ones no doubt need to follow up on this for themselves so we want to point to okay here we go here we go we're in genesis chapter 25 all right some key points talmudim grab your pen your paper sacred scripture bring a willing and attentive mind shema yisrael sima sima rastafari so here in Genesis chapter 25 says, and these are the generations of Isaac, Abraham's son. Abraham begat Isaac, verse 19, verse 20. And Isaac was 40 years old when he took Rivka, Rebekah, to wife, the daughter of Bethuel, the Syrian of Pandan Aram, the sister of Laban, the Syrian. And Yitzhak and Isaac entreated Yahweh, Jehovah, for Ishto, for his wife, because she was barren. And Yahweh, hey, Yahweh, Hakadosh Baruch Hu, Baruch Hashem, was entreated of him, and Ribka Ishto, his wife, conceived. Verse 22. And the children, these sons, Esau and Yaakov, right? We don't know them as Esau and Yaakov yet, according to the chronological narrative, but these two children, these children, they struggle together within her. And she said, If it be so, why am I thus? Why am I like this? And check this she went to inquire of Hashem of Yahweh of he who be who he be Hakadosh Baruch Baruch Hashem who in the translation says of the Lord that's the Gentile tetragrammaton right but Yahweh is the Hebrew we say tetragrammaton pointing to the Hashem the name so she went who went she went note that in verse 21 Yitzhak entreated Yahuwah, right, for Ishto. But in verse 22, it says, And she went to inquire of Yahweh. Hey. Verse 23, And Yahweh, hey, and he who be we be said to her, Two nations are in thy womb, and two men of people. To what? Two nations are in thy womb. And what? And two manner. Two manner, two kinds, two manner of people shall be separated from thy bowels, and the one people shall be stronger than the other people. And what does it say? The elder shall serve right, the younger. The elder shall serve the younger. Now, why is that important? Well, that's important because if we're going to see how it ends, we got to look at, well, how did it begin? Right? How did it begin? Now, we can get into some of the matters concerning the birthright further on. It basically describes the two. And some will go here and based on the um, English only or English mainly and deep ending on the translator and not really studying for themselves. From verse 24 to 26, they derive based on the description of Esau where he came out red. It says all over like a hairy garment 
and they called his name Isa. Now, what's interesting is that in Hebrew, Adam, right? Adam refers to a type of redness. But see, the redness here is the ruddiness, the reddish brown like the ground. Because the word for the reddish brown ground, right? That soil, nutrient rich soil, reddish brown ground is Adama. Right? So we can ask the question since in Luke's gospel and elsewhere in the scripture, we can link that Adam, in that sense, was a son of Hilahim, of the power, the Elohim. Right? Therefore, a son of God. So if God is his father, well, who is his mother? Well, we know we have the word in the Hebrew, Adama. Now, the Adama is a particular type of ground. There's many different kinds of ground. That's a reddish brown ground, right? Now, some would say, well, well, Esau is a white man because when he, he blushes or he gets angry, he turns red. I think we need to go here just for a kind of a visual, right? For visual purposes right here to show a visual. Right? Okay, we're going to start. We're going to start. We're going to start with this one right here. This is another kind of um, a table of the nations kind of a chart right here a table of the nations right that's one version this is another version um, pointing with the ancient um, Mitzrayim or Kamiti um, um illustrations that was from ancient Egypt they the wall painting that's from Seti's, Seti's tomb right there right and Seti represents a latter period of time and this is a, another one this is one that we kind of favor right here 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 we've utilized this before this right here is the fake this is one of the fake ones right here this is one of the fake ones right here all right um this is this is the you could say the point of reference of the fake one we just showed you like the table of the nations needs to be really re-examined and we can't look at the table of the nations today and try to assume that that's what it was in the approximate time that what is written in Moshe's first book in Bereshit in Genesis is pointing to peoples there's only few there's few peoples that have remained in the lands that they were in thousands of years ago this can be historically proven we have the various different migrations right migrations movements some peoples have been exterminated when we say exterminated some peoples are no more we have like the tasmanian people we know and you can refer to their stories where some of the people that were are no more or they've been absorbed into other people groups so there are some peoples a few peoples who are approximately still in their ancient lands and when we say ancient lands we're speaking of from a period of three to up to five or more thousand years ago right so a lot of this table of the nations like this one right here ham shem and japheth according to this all appear to be some form of i guess a white whitish man a lot of this is from so-called white supremacy point of view and then they do this right here where they insert notice that that Japheth and Shem are some kinds of, I uh, believe, white man, though Japheth looks kind of curious there, right? But then we have the ham right there. Notice their pick is black and white picture, <laughs> and that's supposed to be the black man, right? So this uh, racism and white supremacy, as Dr. Francis Cress, Dr. Francis Cress Welsing has pointed out in her ISIS papers, is a very good point of reference, right? Very good point of reference as it affects the nine areas of people activity. The solution for us is Jalor HaTorah, the direction, instruction, the glory of His Majesty, the B-I-B-L-E, the Holy Bible with the Spirit of Truth, the Holy Spirit, can help us now utilize the wisdom, the wisdom of that document, that testimony in undoing the curse and the consequences, the adverse consequences in the nine areas of people activity vis-a-vis -vis, um, white supremacy, right? What is called white supremacy. And when we use that term, we are referring to that in the context of Dr. Francis Cress Welsing's 
her work, the ISIS paper, and also her teacher or mentor, Dr. Nellie Fuller Jr. All right, but just to get to this right here, so we can make our other point. Okay, we saw this right here. Now we can touch on this, but here, you know this right here. Now this is more or less, kind of less than more, but still, because we think that some of the other pictures, how they lighten up some of the pictures. But look at the Egyptian. You see the brown in the complexion. Do you see the reddish tone? Have you ever seen somebody who you know was a black person, right? But when their picture is taken, for example, you see them in a picture, there's a reddish undertone. As a reddish, when we say red, we're not saying red in the white supremacist sense of red. We're saying red in the true nature, ruddy in the true nature sense of red. You see, it's like some people don't really know about animals, like about living creatures. All they know is about cartoon. So some people confuse cartoon animals that they watch on TV because of this um, times of the Gentile um, um, deprogramming. You know, or like when I say deprogramming, deprogramming us from the creational, natural way we should be seeing things into this artificial paradigm. So what we're pointing out here is that here we know that the ancient Egyptians were black people, but you can see the reddishness in their brown. And we also have ground that matches perfectly. In fact, when they say Kemet, Kemet, they say, well, that's the black land because Kam means black. Well, that is approximately true. But if you really look at the so-called Kamta, like the land, it is so reddish brown, it's so dark, deeply reddish brown. It goes through all the, the, the stages of the reddish brown until it appears black. And this kind of is a good analogy both for the Adam, the Adam from the Adama. The Adama is that reddish brown, you know, that soil, that ground. We just didn't take, um, we should have had a picture, but some ones and ones, if you're outside of the city, you probably know what I'm talking about. And if you are citified and you went out into the country, you probably seen and probably were surprised as we were when we see this reddish brown ground, right? And then if you put your hand next to it, we need to have some pics of that. We have it elsewhere. You can see that many of our complexions as melanated so-called black people match that ground. And even that reddish brown ground might depends on the nutrient richness can even become darker in color. So the Kemet, the calm land, right? We say it's black, but really it is so deeply reddish brown. When we say reddish brown. So this term ruddy in the scripture does not mean red in the sense of like like I heard some white people and some people who are victims of white supremacists even though rhetoric even though they be white people they've been saying like oh well Adam was a white man because it says red because when a white man blushes or when he gets angry he you can see the red the blood come under his skin I said that's nonsense that's nonsense right there for example even right here even right here to zoom in right here you can see in both these complexions one properly is the um, the ancient the Romu, the ancient Egyptian right, type and the other, some call the Asiatic type, the Amo type, we say it's the Israelite type right? and notice how they have this one down here darker than up here right? which is a little curiosity but here you can even see the reddish brown right here but it's a deep reddish brown all right, deep reddish brown. Let's go through this right here. This is another version of it from one of their books. Let's go through this right here, and then here's where they get a little very goofy. And it's just interesting that this part of the of the of the wall painting seems to have fallen off. Isn't that curious? Because no doubt they read it, and when they read what they read and say, Oh, that's the Hebrew, that's the Israelite. All right, looking at the Rasta man with the locks in the back and ting and ting in the beard, right? What they did was mar it, all right? Now, we don't have the proof that they marred it. Well, we do have the proof, but 
we didn't see them and we don't have like a video showing them marring it and and damaging it but it's kind of interesting that some things when we look at some Egyptian archaeology some things just happen to be that right there is damaged ain't that something <laughs> how curious it is right you can see the red right that red the reddish tone you can see the reddish tone even right here right and the one that's to commit to you you can see that reddish tone orange reddish well not orange but you, you you get the idea right so even with their colors when they sought to display right the colors they brought that out okay let's go right here okay this is good right here you can see even right here this is from this Mohammed there's this Mohammed movie I think called messenger about the Prophet Muhammad and and the flight the Hijrah to um, Ethiopia and the meeting with who the Muslims call the Najashi, which is really a corruption, at least it's an Arabization of Negus, right? You can see the reddish in his complexion. I see the red, right? And, you know, see the white man says, oh, he's black and he's white. But he's not really black, black so much. There are some who are very melanated that do appear black. But there is a cafe au lait to so-called blue-black, right? And then between the cafe au lait and the blue-black of black people, generally speaking, melanization, there is that reddish-brown, right? And we can see this right here. This is what be the Najashi that... Um, you know, brought them, you know, brought them forward. You can see over here one of their paintings right here, right? So different colors are used by different artists. Let's come out of this for a moment and let's see if we can bring up, like you see right here where, where of course, this looks a little bit maybe oversaturated, but you can see the reddish brown. Is he Esau? Because he's reddish brown. And the thing that surprised me is that there were some pictures that I had. I just it was a picture just take it as a picture and one of them a few of them came out very very red I, and I'm like oh man that looks so red right there then I started to look at it carefully look at other pictures carefully like here's will be like SETI you can see the reddish undertone within his complexion so red in the Bible because red is in the Bible it is not generally speaking of white people the only reason why many think that is because they're still in the sense of their knowledge base half original i mean they might know they're israelites so forth and so on but they still have the subliminal effects of white rhetoric and white supremacy we have to remember that we were and over 400 years subjected to a particular society a world view Right, even we could say part of it is um, what's that? What's that terminology they use? Um, like generational, right? Part of it's generational. Now look at this right here. Can you see the reddish brown in his complexion? See, I say this because the first man, right, according to the scripture, is Adam. One way of interpreting Adam is Aleph, the first Hebrew letter referring to first or chief right or in a symbolical nature ox like an ox right um and then we have dom dom means blood you ever seen blood now when blood is fresh you know it may have a lighter red right but then when it coagulates what happened it gets darker in tone right that's blood so alef dom adam but then we have the word in Hebrew for that reddish brown, right, nutrient rich ground, and it's called the Adama. Now, Adama is in a feminine sense, right? Adama. That's all we, when we ask, well, who is Adam's mother? Remember who asked it first, right? And answered it, who's Adam's mother? Well, according to the scripts, right, Adama, Adama, right? And Adama is speaking about that ground, right? The ground. So here, 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 we can see this even right here where they have this split screen mm -hmm. of this East uh, African. Um, he could be a Somali type. We, we have Afro-Shemitic people, Kamo-Shemitic people, 
right? That share both of those, you could say, DNA genetics type. Kamo, Hamo, like Ham, like speaker like Kemet or that portion and the Shemetic, speaking of more like the scripture and the Israelite aspect, you know, according to the scripture. So you can see right there, even in his complexion, that's the actual picture, right? Actual picture. And some of y'all probably know what I mean. Now, he has a little less of that reddish. You get this? You see the difference here? He has more of that reddish. Right? More of that reddish right here. Right? And he has less. Now, this one here is comparing him, I think that's Seti. Right? With Seti. Right? I think Seti the first. If we're correct. And this is Ankanatan. Right? Ankanatan. Right? And you can see he has less. He has more of a tan brown. Mm -hmm. So when we talk about Jacob and Esau. Right? Based on the scripture and based on the good uh, Yodit, Yehudit, called Hebrew understanding, right? As well as the contextual, uh, the contextual cultural perspective, because language tells you a lot when you really study it. You know, just using the Blue Letter Bible or Strong's Concordance is a good stepping stone, but many ones are stumbling over that stepping stone and, and yadin. I and I have to come forward and seek to, you know, give some gems and give it time to marinate because we were one of the first that started to do these vids and go into the Septuagint just to bring out a point of reference to help to um, edify, like build up and strengthen a lot of the seekers' scholarship, their own scholarship as well as their own understanding, right? But here we have more of an Esau. Right, more of the Esau type. All right, maybe with one exception. What's that one exception according to the scripts? That one exception according to the scripts is the hairy part. Remember how Esau or Esau is described. So let's turn right here to Genesis, Genesis chapter 25, verse um, verse 25, 25, 25, and the first came out red. Right, ruddy, that means reddish brown, all over. Then it says, like a hairy garment. Did he come out red all over like a hairy garment? So a hairy garment is red. Or did he came out, remember we're looking at the translation here. He came out red, right? And all over he was hairy. He was red and hairy. Now, tell me, are black people, are black men, are any black men hairy? Mm -hmm. We know that when we start to look at certain Africans, right, or or more, I want to say pure, I don't like to use that terminology in just loosely, but more, like we say, pure Africans, a lot of Africans, right, certain Africans, especially West Africans or Africans that may be more like, um, we could say, when we use the Ham, Shem, and Japheth, just using this point of reference, more Hamitic Africans, they tend to be less hairy. And sometimes when we come across certain um, East Africans, for example, the beards, right? The beards. There are some Africans that do not grow full beards, right? Even among some Rastafari, and they're black people, have been over here for some 400 years, but some of them don't grow full beards. We notice that when we go east of the river now, in that particular region, which is also an Israelite region, have many ancient tribes and people that are positive links and identifiers for the Israelites who are black people east of the, you know, river now, we know that many of them can grow full beards. But when we go west, generally speaking, of the river now, like into West Africa, Many of the indigenous or more indigenous black people there, when we're referring to the men, right, in this example here, since we're speaking of two men, Esau and Jacob, many of them are not quite able, they're more smooth, they don't grow full beards, right? Now, here we have an Esau type in the redness, but then the scripture says all over like a hairy garment, and they called his name Esau. They called his name Esau. Now, 
according to just a basic biblical perspective, Esau and the theology of the scripts, Esau is to stand for the mere man of the earth. Right? Remember the earth, the Adama, the mere man of the ground, the earth. Right? In many respects, some might say that Esau may appear to be the nobler man naturally, according to the nature of things. For example, we see Esau, he's a man out there. He, he was out in those fields out there. As we would say today, he was out in the streets out there. He's a hunter, right? almost like he's a gangster. He's a hunter. He's out there. He's a go-getter. Well, we have Yaakov. We have Jacob. What about Jacob? Right? And after that, came his brother out and his hand took notice nothing was said about his brother mm. no description so with Esau Esau being called red or ruddy and King David being called red or ruddy that has led to even the white man in a lot of their pseudo Christian scholarship and in counterfeit Christianity to say that well David was a white man. You know, that's what a lot of them say, that David was a white man. Or some black people in some of the camps think that, well, he was, he was like, say, light-skinned in the sense of, like, you know, maybe, like, more like, maybe, you know, light-skinned in that sense because it says red and ruddy. So what we find here is a kind of a cognitive dissonance, right, because ones are reading a Shemitic or an Eastern book from a Western Gentile mentality. And they are misinterpreting an Eastern book from a Western Gentile mentality. And so most of us over here, the Beit Yisrael, the Beta Israel in the Americas and the Caribbean after 400 years, we should understand why there would be a kind of a default it's not really directly our fault initially because the default since we've been exposed to so-called white supremacist western gentile white man's rhetoric right and his lies or his errors his ignorance and his distortion of the scripture so even we recognize that we are baita yisrael or bait yisrael and that this is ours we still have to be careful for that mentality Right, you know, for those um, thorns and thistles, as it were, in our mentality, that even though we're saying we are the people and they're black, still there are elements of our interpretation that may be affected by the so called white man, so called way of thinking, like that whole red and ruddy thing, right? Because many of the arguments that we hear from some of the um, like one Westers, the 70 AD, the 1970 AD Israelites, Latter-day Israelites, right? That, that Latter-day, we could say, branched off from the more authentic teaching that we hold to, that's namely the Ethiopian Hebrew, the commandment keepers, right? You know, Congregation of the Living God, the Royal Order of the Ethiopian Hebrews, the Black Jews of Harlem, that's the original, we say that's more of the original teaching that we as Rastafari Jews, Rastafari Yehudi, we hold to right there. But then we have like about 40, you know, about 40 or so years. Note, note that from the 1930s before the 30s, roaring 20s and about a little over 40 to maybe 50 years later, we get like the ISUPK the Israeli or Israelite School of Universal Practical Knowledge, some of the same gems of our roots can be found amongst them. But then some other things have, have, have crept in, right? So on the Esau, Esau, and Jacob. Now, I know a lot of folks be like, oh, man, no, because you're believing, it seems easier to believe that, well, Esau is a white man when it says he came out red. This means that he came out he came out white. Then when we find in the King James translation, David is called ruddy. We'll say, oh, that's different than red. But then if we go to Adomni, Adomni, you get to the Hebrew, right? We get to or the uh, Yodit, Yehudit, right? We get to find that it's from the same root. And when we trace it all the way to the root, right, we have Adam, Aleph Dam, first blood. 
So a translation of Adam first blood and Adam, the link with Adama, which is a particular, like it's like farming soil. It's like soil that's ideally good for us. Like in the Caribbean, down south, certain places are known parts of Africa and no doubt Asia and other parts of the world, but I definitely know in the Caribbean and, and down south. Or more, I know down south. I've seen it down south. Geechee and Gullah Nation, to hail up the Geechee and Gullah Nation. That's I9 people on the I9 maternal side, but the Geechee and Gullah Nation, Gullah, Gala, Oromo, I that you know we have these particular links, and I seen that particular soil. It was the most I was like, wow. This, because the thing I noticed is that with my complexion, right, being like a reddish brown, some say, say, I don't know, dark, I don't know what, not dark, dark, but kind of midway. I think the Ethiopic term is, uh, is it Tainama, something like that. Anyway, we noticed that it was like, it was like it matched our complexion, the ground. I said, wow, that's interesting. Now, later on, learning that Adama is that particular reddish brown, like farming, we could say ground, we said, oh, Adam, black man, that's a, and we say black man, not just in the generic sense of black, which we might refer to on the conscious level, but black in the sense of when we talk about melanin, we have all the shades from blue black, as it said, right? to cafe au lait, like we say lighter skin and we talking about people who are cafe au lait who are black peoples without having white genes you see what i'm saying not those who may be mulatto or are a byproduct of um so-called like mixed genes right or so-called what they call nowadays interracial genes right so there are many indigenous black peoples right both then and even now, but especially then, right, who range complexions from cafe au lait, golden, you know, like it was a golden brown, right, or golden complexion, cafe au lait, so to speak, to blue black, you know, very dark skin, very richly melanated, and between having, between having that reddish brown different shades of the reddish brown so we get the isol the esau type also being hairy right and we get the jacob type i know many people say oh only the white man the white man is hairy well yes and it becomes more obvious to see the so-called white man let me just introduce this here the canaanite the white man is descended of the canaanite I know this is going to, because, see, a lot of things have been um, turned upside down, right? But we can, first of all, going to the scriptures, right, and looking at the biblical genetics, as well as looking at the DNA, right? Biblically, scripturally speaking, that connects with the other exhibits, the other historical, the other scientific evidences. We know that the so-called white man, right, genetically speaking, Right, recessive gene speaking comes from a dominant gene, right, which is a black gene, right. And this is what ones and ones amongst the so-called consciousness community have have said, right, both in the past and the present time, that the so-called white man, right, comes from the black man. I think also we have Frances Cress Wells sings in her paper, the ISIS paper, the key to the colors, the colors. So that melanin, when we say black, we're saying that generically because black people probably think just dark, a dark color. So they're not thinking in the sense of black in its, um, in its uh, how can we say, in its psychological aspect. So when we say black, it's a generic term. It's like when we say white. Some people, some white people are very pale. Some white people are not so pale. Some white people have a tan, so forth and so on, or have a, a you know, a, even some complexion there, right? So there's ranges, right? There's ranges. We need to have that balance there because otherwise a lot of one's hermeneutics, biblical interpretation, and actual real life worldly action become deranged, right? When there's no balance. Here we brought this up to show the reddish brown here. 
right? Because it's pointing about red. Oh, look at that over here. This one here is reddish brown. Notice these three complexions. That's perfect right there. These three complexions from the Beni Hassan. Notice these three complexions right there. Just take a moment. Go from right to left or from left to right. Just note the complexions. The complexions. Now today, if we were to see these particular, these three individuals or individuals with their general complexion, we would probably say they're all black. If we saw these three brothers walking down the street or just hanging out, sitting down, chatting or playing ball or what, 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 what have you, right? We see these three brothers together right here. We would say that they all are black. One is a little lighter. One is more reddish brown. My one is more darker, you could say brown, right? Darker reddish brown, right? You know, and if he got darker, he'd be more black in that sense as far as of complexion. But all three of them will be termed to be black men. Even though, according to this particular wall painting, right, they are, there are at least two different groups, two different ancient ethnicities so to speak at least two different ancient ethnicities one might be termed or called more of a Shemitic uh, ancient Shemitic the Amu right and then or the the heck the heck shouse some say heck shouse right the heck uh, the shepherd right people also link with the we could say the early um, Hebrew slash children sons of Jacob and then we have a commit to you a mitz a mitzri right and then we have another mitzri right the one who's in front over there the other mitzri the one holding the document these are two mitzris and we'll see often in ancient Egypt where they would show differences slight differences of their own complexions but then when we read or have it interpreted for us we have is that they both are Egyptian. They both are like citizens and they both are considered to be of the same nation, the same people. All right. So it's that white supremacy that has, uh, it's not really supremacy, it's a lie, but that lie called white supremacy that has really confused, right, themselves, the authors of the lie, right, and also us now as we seek to come up from under the lie. So when we say right here, these are some other very interesting exhibits. It seems like, you know what it seems like? It seems like you could tell that the other men standing on the both sides of the darker, right? The darker man, right? We can tell that both of them probably were darker. Doesn't it seem as though somebody went out of their way to chip away the paint or lighten it up? But then if we look at some of the features, like some of the features and complexions, right? I noticed that they look like brethren, all of them. But especially these two right there, right? The two at the end, right? But it seems like somebody went through a lot of labor, right? Now, ones will say, well, it was old and it was fading away. And see how they, they adjust the colors right there. But you can tell that they, somebody chipped it away so then they, could, then they could pretend that it's lighter, right? And instead of saying that, well, these are black men, right? And even within their the way they carry themselves with their beards, right? And they're here, right? Almost like Rastaman in that sense, or Hebrew and Ethiopian Hebrew and Israelite in that sense. One can say, oh no, they're white people. You can see that they have chipped away. You see the darker, look at his leg down here. You see this leg down here? That was his complexion. Reddish, brown, but they chipped that away, right? They have chipped that away. So that shows that something was done to this. This is even a little more clear right here. Something was done to it. And after a while, they'll say that the, the man behind him, right, on the right-hand side, that he was, um, they try to say, he had gold in here. You see how they deceive us with some of these pictures and how they refilter and adjust these pictures, right? Even over here, it seems as though they did the same thing with this individual over here. All right? Because nobody looks like that. He looked very ghostly. All right? Notice that. And he's wearing a full, um, what, simla? The simla is like a full garment. It's like the garment, the long robe, what they call like the long robe. Right? We went from the Hebrew, the long robe. All right? Which 
also kind of links with the the afro shemitic you know type or the ones from the Kana'an, right who were not necessarily Kana'an, right it's almost like to say that you know there's many people who say they're american but their their ancestry comes from someplace else you get that difference there where people who are american and they're not American in the sense of their ancestors came over here on the Mayflower or were pilgrims or came over here under that charter given by Great Britannia, but they have come and become a part of this. They have been, what's the word used, naturalized, right, within that culture. See, all these factors we need to take into consideration when we're seeking to understand the Bible, understand the word, and more importantly, who's who. Now, note this right here. Wow, you see this right here? Let's go over here, right? Now, of course, this is two different paintings or two different, um, yeah, you could say paintings or wall paintings, so to speak. But you can notice this one is in the same garment. You can see the same one is in the same type of similar garment. You can see that one is wearing a long garment, right? We know that many of the Egyptians or the Mitzri, the Mitzrayi, don't always wear long garments. Occasionally they do. Some of their gods or deities or whatnot, their natures or what have you, they might, right? And then the Tert, you know, the, the female, you know, woman, they, they would wear longer garments. But that long garment, was known to be a garment of distinction. In fact, Yawasaf, Yosef, had a garment like that, with the exception that there was many, it was heavily embroidered, right? But note, he's wearing a skull cap, right? And note, also note his complexion and note the reddish and the brownness there. Just to prove, I think, I think black people have to really begin to understand this reddish brown thing that reddish brown, from the scriptural perspective, should not be confounded with reddish brown from the white supremacist Western Gentile world conception. In other words, there's a confusion, right, of colors. ISIS paper, key to the colors. There's a confusion of colors. There is also a confusion, you know, there's a confusion of tongues, right? There's a confusion of linguistics. Like when the white man or a lot of so-called white scholars speak about red in the Bible and try to insinuate or falsely make the declaration that Adam in the scripture was a white man, right? It is important to, to, to note that their way of interpreting red is different than the biblical by the biblical point of reference for red, right? The biblical point of reference for red, which we have been seeking to um, articulate here, but first of all, to give some, you know, to give some examples. It's important to give some samples and examples of what we are speaking about here. So therefore, we go through this right here. You can see how here they're kind of scrubbing it, but you can tell by them making it lighter, you can see how dark his complexion was. Right? I'm sure he didn't have um, fuchsia complexion, like somebody with a fuchsia, you know, lavender, or fuchsia, some high color like that. Right? So here, boom, look at this right here. You see the difference? So when we're looking at some of the art and facts, we have to do due diligence, as I and many of the Talmudim, we see to just go through, like, like save all of them and then examine each one before we would save the one that we liked, but then we just save them all, right? And just have them all there so we can reference and see if there's any differences, nuances, how come there's more information over here? They must have did something to the picture or they must have done something to, you know, this over here, but look at this right here. You see this one right here? Look at the complexion right here. Now, are you gonna tell me that his beard was the same color as his as his skin <laughs> are you going to tell me that the man with the skull cap that seems to be wearing the patan like skull cap right yehudi like skull cap are you going to tell me 
that is that an afro is this skull cap well that's his hair very close crop or is it a skull cap okay regardless of what that is are you going to tell me that his beard was the same complexion doesn't it seem as though somebody chipped away at this I or use some kind of a bleach or something like that because look over here right here you could tell you see the dark patches you see the dark patches the dark patches tell you what his complexion was like you see how how dark his complexion would have been like that's the true complexion of this person and their beard was not the same as their you know so what their skin grew it wasn't a beard but it was a skin a skin beard no it's that they have done something to these pictures right this is why we have to study it carefully once again you see the long robe right and what appears to be like a towel a t the towel the tav right or the cross but from ezekiel the mark right and here 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 you can see all of them are wearing the long robes right this long robe right now why is that important that's important because of the narrative in Bereshit in Genesis, right? Concerning the Israelites, concerning Joseph, both in Genesis as well as in Exodus and elsewhere in the Torah, the five books of Moshe, it speaks of this garment, right? See, when you're just reading the King James Version, it just says a garment, you know? It just says garment. But then when you're studying the Hebrew, the Masoretic Hebrew, you find in different areas there's different kind of garments and you do due diligence to find out, well, okay, well, what does this mean? How is this word for garment different than that word for garment? This is a similar right here, all right? Now note this right here as we zoom in on his face, all right? We see all the telltale signs, all right, of the Hebrew Israelite. Have you noticed that? Some are smooth face, some have fake beards, like the Egyptians, they would have fake beards. So it seemed as though some of the native indigenous and Egyptians of certain periods of time may not have grown beards or did not grow out their beards. We, we would think that the first was probably more commonly true, that they were not really able to grow beards, but in homage of their ancestors or gods or or wise men or great ones of renown of ancient time that they sought to either live in their image or at least project their image they had the false beard we even see Hatshepsut right Pharaoh's daughter Pharaoh's daughter do the same thing right but yet the indigenous people did not seem like certain Africans, we point this out, certain Hamitic Africans, Hamitic Africans, do not grow beards. You know what I'm saying? So here when we see this one with the long garment, as the Hebrews are described to have worn, right? And then also with the other cultural signs of the full beard, right? And also a pretty large amount of hair, right locks or dreads or locks you know but a large amount of hair and they're here similar to like where some of us we would have uh you know what they call it um some sort of a, a tam or or um you know the stocking cap so to speak you can see that right there though it probably wasn't called a stocking cap but you understand what we're saying right there so here this is this is the the hebrew the Hebrew type, right? This is the Hebrew type. We find this over here. You can see their beard, right? Remember how um, the Levites were supposed to shave in that sense? So we even have one that's bald, if he is bald, right? We don't know whether these pictures have been, how much they've been touched up, but you can tell that right here, this one appears lighter, right? This one in the center right there, but notice around his mouth. Is he really lighter or do we have chipping? Look at his hands. We can see where it's like there is gradations of the complexion that seems to be gone. On some of the other characters, maybe it was harder to do or they did not have time to do it. Right? And this is just pointing out, like, now, notice what they do here. This is also a confusion of white supremacist uh, Egyptologists. But note what they say. They call the indigenous, um, the indigenous uh, Mitzri, Mitzrayim, 
they say he's red. Note that, check. Who does the scripture overtly describe physically as being red? Based on the scripture, we have Adam from the Adama, Aleph Dam, first blood, Adama, reddish brown ground, right? We have Esau, Esau, right? And we also have David, right? Solomon is called red and like, 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 like he's, 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 he's ruddy and they say white. Now some say, oh, he was white. Could it not be speaking of the simla, the long garment? Like a knight in shining armor, right? The shining armor, the, the white robes, right? Or later on, even the armor, armor, right? The next one they say, which is more the Amo, the Israelite type. You see the fringes there. They say yellow. The next one they say black. The next one they say white. And they say this is on types of mankind, right? And they say that the, the ancient Egyptian division of mankind into four species, and they say the 15th century BC. This is around the time of uh, Seti, from Seti's tomb. But we already showed you where they have scraped away the paint, causing confusion. We see between the one they call the red and the yellow, there's a closer complexion between them in that reddish brown spectrum, right, than we necessarily have in the Tanesi. Right? or the Nessia people, right? Some will say even Kush, the one that they say is black. And then we have the one they call the Tama, some call the Tamahu, or some refer to as the Libyan, right? Who is white and tatted up, right? So here they release this right here, right? Back in the time when they were formulating this white supremacist rhetoric. And they then, once they formulate it by counterfeit like Egyptology and and twisting facts and changing records and and scraping off paint off of monuments and doing a lot of other funny tricks and lighting up or Europe the so-called white you know Europeanizing white Europeanizing the features right we saw actual pictures where they must have had an artist who was pretty good artist a lot of their artists were good artists but they were drawing a, a painting and you can see that they clearly put the faces or the features, the facial features, the phenotypes of their patrons, the ones who sent them over there to draw the pictures. Because now we can compare the pictures that they drew before they could take pictures. And then we see the earliest pictures and even the latter pictures and we compare and we can see something is wrong with their head. Something was wrong with their head because they probably thought that, I mean, who could think the camera would come about? Well, Ja does. He mentions this basically, if not overtly, but covertly in the scripture. All I shall see him, that eye of the camera. So with that eye of the camera, that generally gives a more truthful right, um, testimony than their handmade paintings. And see here with that red, yellow, black, white, this was to go along with their four to five races philosophy and then once they did this in the so-called archaeological pseudo-scientific community then many ones picked this up biblically and scripturally right and started to preach this with the so-called bible and this is what we refer to as white anglo-saxon protestant christianity was christianity or counterfeit christianity right now this type bears a lot in common with the white man at least culturally and according to you know the tattoos and even on some of the more accurate monuments that we have looked at you can see where his eyes are blue this is a drawing of the next one right this is another drawing of the next one but you can see the tattoos that they use there's a few of them that have the colors more right and we noted them as blue eyes right they had blue eyes Okay, we want to touch on this right here. Let's pull out. This is this is related to something somewhat related. I mean, you can even see the red kind of come through here. You can see his garment is red, but you can see where the red, the reddish brown is in his complexion. All right? The reddish brown is in is in his complexion. All right? And you have different shades of what we generally, you know, would call or can call to be black. 
right? You know, different shades, right? In that spectrum, right? Now, you have to remember that in the ancient times, people understood that and knew that. And they didn't have this kind of knee-jerk reaction that people do today. So the question is, why do people have that sort of knee-jerk reaction today? People, people, people have that knee-jerk reaction today because of uh, racism and white supremacy. When we say racism, we're saying racism as defined by Dr. Francis Cress Welsing, as well as Nellie Fuller Jr. and other scientists and scholars of our people who did due diligence to really prove their, their theses, you know, and give us evidence that still bears accurate, right and accurate proof. We can still put their theorems to the test and still prove it. So the white man is not Esau. The white man is not Esau. The white man is actually related to the Canaanite, the biblical Canaanite people. And this is not to say that all of the ancient Canaanites were like white people as we call white people today, right? But the recession of genes, right, can be found there, right? This is one of the reasons why when we look even from the biblical history, archaeological history, it seems as though they, they were 11 tribes of them and they up and got out of that land. This is what's very interesting, that there were 11 tribes of them, and they seem to have upped and got themselves out of that land. Could that be certain physical changes, right? certain physical changes that might cause people to find it, like when people move? Somebody says, hey, the weather around here is not really good for me. I, even when we say that the so-called white man, you know, was not ones like, you know, Jesus or Yeshua, and the Israelites or the Hebrews because that region of the world, right, is in the epicenter of the sun, right? And based on what we know of the genetics today. Speaking of genetics today, we, there's a good article. We'll have to find this again and bring it forward. It should still be out there. The actual name, we don't recall, but what it was speaking about, some of y'all might recall it and may be able to share it. It was speaking about... Um, how the white man, like like the white man is recent. The white man is recent. It was a, a one of those scholarly papers where they went through some research, but they was taking on some of the perspectives that some of our teachers have taken on when they have spoken about the true kind of origins of what we call like white people, so-called white people today. But these are kind of artificial terminologies and we use them like in grace and very, um, you know, um, liberally, so to speak, you know, using these particular, you know, generously use these terminologies. They're not really scientific, you know, terms, right? Because this whole idea of white supremacy is a pseudoscience. It's not really a true science term. And this article is exposing that white people, so to speak, are recent. It's like a recent... I guess we can use the term here because it applies here. The white man, in a sense, evolved. Some might prefer devolved, since we're talking about recessive genes from black people, right? Historically, right? And over a period of some thousands of years, right? This is also what was behind ones like um, Adolf Hitler and some of the Nazi and fascist, you know, racist propaganda you know, of um, the recent past when he was talking about, you know, trying to purify the white race and get back to this blonde hair, blue eyed particular type, right? They view that or those who ascribe to that idolatry or ideology, they view that as being, you know, as being the purity, right? So much so that they went against other people that we might call white people, right? Like certain European, Ashkenazi, other sort of um, Germanic Jews. Also, black people were in that mix there too, right? If you really understand what J.A. Rogers in, when well, he said, nature knows no color line, right? And the proof of that is the Esau and Jacob narrative, that nature knows no color line. 
because they both were from the same mother and they both had physically speaking the same father but when we say that the white man is not Esau but he's under the dispensation of Esau he's under the dispensation of Esau and he's under the curses of Esau let's bring this out right here okay not 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 this right here let's see if we can um, how the how how will we do this right here let's go over here let's see okay no that's that's not it. I'm I'm on my I'm on my desktop. Let's go over here. Okay. Boom. Yeah, I think we're right there. Okay, let's see if this hopefully that holds. Okay, because we're on airplane mode. Okay, so here, 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 what do we have here? From the apocrypha, from fourth asterisk, right? From fourth asterisk. We have got no internet connection. Let's do this right here. We're getting low on on memory available memory so from fourth Ezra 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 right right four Ezra right and six here right verse eight nine and ten and he said to me to me not not to me not unto me but to me from Abraham to Isaac Yitzhak when Jacob, Yaakov, and Esau, Esau were born of him, Jacob, Yaakov's hand, held first the heel of Esau. Held first the heel of who? Esau. This is the important verse here, verse 9. For Esau, Esau is the end of the world, and Yaakov and Jacob is the beginning of it that followeth. And then it says in verse 10, the hand of man is betwixt the heel and the hand. Other question, Estrus, ask thou not. Now, this is very, very important because um, Estrus is one to know, like, well, how long, how long? You know, we want to know, like, these are prophecies and this is supposed to happen, but how long will it be and what will it be like? Right? To his specific question, this was said right here, that the end of the world is Esau. So this world system is ruled by the Esau, we say the Esau spirit, right? And those who are of the genetics of Esau. But here's the question, Chabarim. What was the genetics of Esau? Some may have heard us mention this before, right? Have heard us mention this before that, that's Estrus right there, that Esau, right? Esau was a whore. Esau was a whore. I'll make a good title for a video. What do you mean by Esau was a whore? And and here's where the white man connection comes in with Esau. Right? Here's where the white man's connection comes in with Esau. Because it's the Canaan. Canaan. The Canaanite. Right? It's that Canaanite connection. Once you understand the Canaanite connection, you understand why they're trying to rewrite why the nowadays general consensus of um, so-called academics are trying to rewrite a lot of established um, points of view of biblical hermeneutics along with archaeological interpretation. They're trying to rewrite it today. Why? Well, it's like uh, what Brother Inky has said in something. He said... Uh, you know, the rabbit got the gun. <laughs> you know, bottom rail on top, Masa, is because many more of us in this generation, this is the generation that seek thy face, O Jacob, O Yaiko. This is the generation, as we have in Psalm, Psalm 24. This is the generation of them that seek thy face. Here, we're going to have to go to the scripture to bring up the scripture here. All right, there's a lot of details here. We're just seeking to touch on some of the main details. Do you remember, do you recall the blessing that Esau was given? Do you recall the blessing that Esau, that Esau, right, was given? Let's see if we can bring this up right here, right, and let's see if we can, let's go right here. Okay, and let's go over here, tribe of Judah. Let's see right here. 
Okay, let's go over here and let's put Esau. Right, Esau. This is the next level of um, interlinear Bible translation, interpretation, and going into the study here. Blue Letter Bible, we still highly recommend the old classic Blue Letter Bible. Blue Letter Bible, and there's also some other sites, interlinear, but this is the My Sword software, one of the best out there, but I'm sure there's probably others. Let's go right here and let's put cry. Esau cry. Alright. Have you noticed that some of these um these um Christian scholars, pastors, I'm speaking about T.D. Jakes here, at least, but I've heard it from others. It, it's almost like they say that Jacob, his name means trickster. Jacob's name does not necessarily mean trickster. trickster. It comes from the heel, Ikeb, right? They'll make e, the Jacob to be the bad one, and it's almost like they are defending something in counterfeit Christianity especially among black the nowadays black churches churches seem to be defending Esau they are definitely under Esau's spirit and not truly under Yaakov and Israel's spirit especially in a lot of these black churches and I was hearing some stuff from T.D. Jakes I was like oh my goodness oh my goodness it's almost like defending Esau right even when they say that Jacob right he stole the blessing Instead of recognizing that it was to the matriarch, the mother, that that prophecy was revealed. And by the way, let's go right in here. We're going to show you this right here. Let's show you this right here. We're in Genesis chapter 27. Let's just read this first verse right here to put a context. And here is to defend the matriarch, Ribka, Rebecca. All right, so sisters, daughters, mothers, wives, don't say that we don't defend, you know, the righteous woman or the Eshet Chayil, right, the virtuous woman, the strong woman, the strong woman of true faith, right, and the scripture, the Bible is not sexist or feminist. The problem is that many of you all have been reading it, it's like they pull the sexism and the feminism over your eyes. So when you read it, Right, all you read is their lies, but you don't you miss these parts here, like we're about to show ones and ones. Some of y'all know what we're going here, but let's go here. Genesis 27 and it came to pass that when Yitzhak, when Isaac was old and his eyes were dim, so that he could not see, pause, so that what Yitzhak, Isaac, he was old, his eyes were dim, so that he could not see. So here's where we teach that. Rastafari Rabbi teach this that Isaac Yitzhak was legally blind. You heard that terminology before? He was legally blind. What do we mean that he was legally blind? Well, in the legal sense, lawful sense, we're speaking about Ha Torah. How do we know that he was blind? To Torah? Right? He's still a righteous man. You have to remember that the righteous people, the chosen people, Right, can and according to the scripture often do fall short. Right? But their salvation, right, is not just based on them being righteous or the chosen people, right? But it is the true faith in overcoming their fallen nature. Right? Isaac the same way. Because Isaac was about to make a very bad move. See, a lot of the pastors and preachers don't teach it like this, and this is how we know that it's not really the Holy Spirit that's with them, right? They teach it from how they are taught in a lot of these whitewash seminaries. And even if it's a black seminary, like a lot of them, you know, like my earthly father used to say, you know, a lot of ones can't think for themselves. Think for yourself. And not, not just think for yourself in the idiotote sense where you just look your, your own way, even though your own way is wrong. But really look at this right here and hear this. It came to pass that when Isaac was old, no fault on Isaac for being old. He got to live to the point that he was old, right? But it goes on to say that and his eyes were dim and his eyes were dim now the eyes the eyes the window to the soul the eyes but then it goes on to say that he could not see we got to recognize who wrote this first book here Moshe right after the angel of the presence revealed those things from the beginning of creation to the end of days 
right, on Hadassah Sinai, according to the Book of Jubilees. Get a copy, get a copy, Ethiopic Book of Jubilees, the R.H. Charles version. Got some excellent notes. It's a good study to really answer a lot of those questions that ones and ones have about the scripture and the narrative. Ethiopic Book of Jubilees. We have at, that at the L-O-J s l-o-j-s dot o-r-g but he was torah blind he was legally blind now torah often translated as law doesn't really mean law in the western gentile mind sense it more means from yara direction instruction right torah right direction instruction the ethiopic would say orit orit torah torah yara right directions instructions right directions instructions so he was blind to direction instructions people say well what direction instruction were he was blind to the direction instructions in genesis chapter 25 right chapter 25 chapter 25 verse 23 and also the section concerning the sale of the birthright in the ancient Semitic, Shemitic, Afro-Semitic cultures of the, of the East, of East Africa and Arabia, including the Levant, in those particular cultures, right, over in that region of the world, the birthright, see, this is what's not explained so much overtly, right, in the Bible, right, but it's spoken of, and many ones get the wrong interpretation, because they're not interpreting it in the culture, right, of the time. So certain things they don't really understand properly because they are not seeing it the way it should be seen, right? In the culture of the region and the culture of the time, right, in the culture of the region, culture of the time, the birthright is your birth order. How are you born? So to the eldest, the firstborn, Right? To whom more is given, more is required because they're the firstborn, more is given to them. So their baraka, their blessing from baraka, like to multiply like abundance, would be more so is given to the firstborn. We can see that in the Torah, right? In Moshe's law and the Torah, we have those details there, right? Concerning, you know what is due to the firstborn even if his mother like say even if the mother is hated so forth and so on right to that firstborn of the ab bait of the family of the ab bait or the bait ab in the hebrew bait house ab house of the father that's the definition of a family house of the father right so he was blind to what was said right here let's just read this out right here and keep this right here and the Lord said, and, and Yahweh hey, said to her, speaking to Rebekah, two nations are in thy womb, and two men of people shall be separated from thy bowels. And the one people shall be stronger than the other people, and the elder shall serve the younger. You heard that? And the what? The elder shall serve the younger. That's Genesis 25 and 23. Then we get their birth in, in three verses. Then at verse 27, we get to see the, and read the sale of the birthright. Who came out first? It was Esau. So Esau physically, 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 naturally was the firstborn. According to the flesh, he was the firstborn. But in spirit and in truth, he was not. This is why he sold his birthright for K what? Right for K wet like like red stew, right split pea red split pea stew, right. This is why he sold that birthright for K wet, right. And by selling that birthright, what did Esau say? Esau said, "Behold, I am at the point to die." Now people say, "Oh, he was about to die." You believe Esau? Esau is full of games, man. Esau is is field wise. He's field wise. He's like streetwise. Esau is very streetwise. This is why Esau, when it says that Esau was um, naturally, according to the flesh, a seemingly nobler man. Now, some might not understand what we mean by that, right? But think about it. Esau was out there in the field, in the field of like in the streets. He was a hunter, right? Like he was a shotter. He was a shotter, a shot caller. He was a shotter. 
right? In a sense, we could say like Esau was like a gangster, right? He was bad about it. His brother stayed home. It was a homebody. Oh, you're always in the house. He's a homebody dwelling in the tents. That's what it says. It says that Yaakov, Jacob, was a plain man dwelling in tents. And then in verse 28, it says, And Yitzhak loved Esau. He loved Esau. Because why? Why did the father Isaac, the son of Abraham, Abram Ha'ibri, the Hebrew, why did Isaac love Esau? The scriptures tell it. Because he did eat of his venison. What's a venison? Venison is like the meat that he captured and, and cooked up. Right? The meat that he captured. He went out there and hunted and found animals, got them, cleaned it up, cooked up yukta yud for his pops. Pops just love that food. Right? It's like when some Negroes, our people would say, right, Geechee Gala, you know, like some ribs. Right? He liked him some ribs. He, he, and the way his son Ice out did it up. Right? And Rebecca, notice what it says, Ribka, Rebecca loved Yaakov. Now remember, they both are, both of their children, but one had a favoritism. Isaac had a favoritism to Esau, to Esau, right? He was a cunning hunter. He had a favoritism to him because he did eat. A Hebrew got to eat. Israelite got to eat, right? They said the N-word got to eat, right? He had to eat. Right? And because he did eat his venison. So, did he love Esau for the right reasons? Well, it all depends on the person. Right? The food is a way to a man's heart is through his what? Belly. And we can see this true in Yitzhak. Right? And this doesn't take away from Yitzhak being of that righteous Hebrew trinity of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But it does help us to understand the true context of this narrative that a lot of the other, you could say, camps or mansions, my father's house, the Bait Yisrael, the Beta Israel, the house of Israel, my father's house, there's many mansions. Why? This is the parts that they miss, right? And then when ones and ones confront them, you know, on this area of the scripture, you know, they're not able to really stand up because they miss these parts. He could not see. Most are just looking at it from a natural sense that he was naturally like legally blind, right? Like he couldn't really see it naturally. But we're looking at it from the true intent of Moses' first book. What this book is to teach us as 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 the Hebrews and as the sons of Yisrael, the Bnei Yisrael, the Bnei Elohim, right? That he did not see that prophecy. Right? He quite didn't see that prophecy. Right? He quite didn't. What about the sale of the birthright? If you understand or when you understand that the birthright and the blessing go hand in hand. It's like that song. You can't have one if you don't have the other. You know, you can't have one if you don't have the other. You can't have one if you don't have the other. See, that's what people miss. Right? And Esau did this. Listen, Esau came in from the field, right? Notice what it says right here. It says, it says, it says right here, Esau came from the field and he was faint. You mean he came from the field? He's out there playing the field. He's out there in the field and he caught nothing? But it says in the verse before that he was a cunning hunter. He was a good hunter. Right? Beware, respect the hunter, right? They say respect the shotter. Right? He was a good shotter. He was a good hunter. So he came in from the field and he was faint. He didn't have anything. He said, hey, listen, I, I just caught this. Can you cook this up for me? He didn't have anything to contribute, but he must have smelled that, hey, what? That his brother Yaiko, his brother Jacob was making. Mm, 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 that smelled good. I don't, you got to fix me up a bowl. Right? And what did Jacob do? Is Jacob wrong for saying, sell me this day thy birthright? Because Yaiko, though it was not fully developed, right, the birthright, right, the birthright meant something, meant something. He valued it. Jacob saw the higher level of the birthright. 
Esau just took it like, yeah, yeah, I'm the firstborn. It's like sometimes we have siblings in our families, who one who's a firstborn, but they, they don't like being firstborn, right? And it might be hard for them to assume their responsibility as firstborn, right? And you might find that it's the younger child that is doing the real <laughs> heavy lifting, right? But not the firstborn. Right? Things get changed. Things get changed. Because remember that everything after the Garden of Eden, the Garden of Delights, the Garden of Eden, shows now the fall of man. And now man, from that low position, is gradually rising up. Is gradually coming more and more into that Messiah, right? That, that Hila Him, that true good, true God consciousness, right? As we notice the chronological order. Right of Ha Torah and even the scripture from the Brit Shana in the Old Testament to the Brit Chadasha. But here, Yitzhak Isaac was legally blind. Right? He was legally blind. And here's another question. Did Esau oh, okay, let me ask the question like this. Who knew that Esau sold his birthright? We know that Yaakov, Jacob knew that because he's the one that Esau sold his birthright to. And also there with the whole red stew, the red lentil pea stew, whatnot. What, what that was when he was called Edom. Edom, or Edom, and Adam, right, in the Hebrew, is basically from the same root. Right? Though they're different, Adam and Edom is not the same one but both names are from the same root just like Esau and Jacob were from the same matrix of the same matriarch the same womb and no doubt it was the same seed right but this duality good and evil remember that when they ate of that tree now we get the consequences right of good and 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 not good right consequences duality this duality comes into effect. They fell from that singularity into this level of duality. When I say singularity, right? That singularity of the very good into some things would have a good side, but then along with that good side, you will also have what seemingly is the evil side, right? But who else knew that Esau, that Esau sold his birthright? Who else knew that? Hmm? No doubt Rebecca knew that. Rivka knew that. We don't know whether Yitzhak, Isaac knew that, but it's very likely, according to what is written, according to the, the scripts, and according to the narrative in Bereshith, it is likely that Rivka, Rebecca knew that. Right? And moreover, she knew what Yahweh, right? what Hashem, what Jehovah had told her in Genesis 25 verse 23 had told her concerning these two men of people and no doubt over the years she watched her, her children grow up, grow up it says and the boys grew she saw them well Isaac he loved Esau why because of the food that that he captured for what because of what he hunted and captured right did he know that Esau the firstborn natural firstborn son had sold his birthright now what's interesting is that when we read through this narrative in chapter in chapter 27 which some theme as the stolen blessing the the only aspect of the stolen blessing is that Esau wanted to steal the blessing of the firstborn he no longer had the right right he no longer had the right of the firstborn Is that how you say he no longer had the right of the firstborn he no longer had the right of the firstborn because he, he, he sold his birthright. It's, you know, it's like if we have tickets, right? And I have a ticket and I give you my ticket and I take your ticket. That means our order is different now. Though before, naturally, I got the ticket first and then you got the ticket with the number after my number, you know? But then, you know, I, you said to me, hey, sell me your ticket and, and for this. And, I, and we do that. That is a contractual agreement. People don't point out that. He said, why he asked him to sell his birthright? Why didn't Esau say something different? 
Like now that we know this narrative right here, and if you was in the same situation and somebody says, Sell me your birthright, right, and you're a little hungry. You know, you know, like I'm 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 dying or he's dying of hunger, really? There was no famine going on then, back then, or nothing like that. He came in from the field, but then it says he was a cunning hunter. It seems like he was empty handed or he was keeping his capture to himself, which shows something else about his nature, that he was selfish. Right? We know that Esau is the man of the the man of the flesh, the natural man, the carnal minded man. Like counterfeit Christianity and, and so-called pseudo-white supremacy is also in that same spirit. It's a carnal mentality. But here we have the first verse of this chapter and he called es Esau his eldest son and said to him, my son. See, even when it says his right, eldest son, my son. And he said to him, behold. Now here's where the father is saying, yeah, I'm old, I know not the day of my death. You know, now take your weapons, your quiver, your bow. And what well, he says, go out to the field. Remember, earlier Esau was selling his birthright. He came in from the field. Was he empty-handed? He didn't have his weapons, his quiver, his bow. All right? And he says, take me some venison. And then he told about, make this food that I, I like. Now, Rebecca... The one to who the, the seed, the word of prophecy was given. She heard that. Right? She heard that. So you know you have some people who have faith, but they don't move on their faith. Other people who have faith, and they move on their faith, they move on their belief, they move on what they hold to be true. Ribka, Rebecca moved on what she heard to be true. She heard all this, right? When Isaac spake to Esau, his son. Notice what it says, his son, right? Because it was he was more aligned with, he was partial to Esau because of the food. And Esau went to the field to hunt for venison and bring it. And then Rebekah spoke to Jacob. That's why Rebekah could say, all right, you know, um, this curse you're saying that's going to be on you for doing this thing, let it be on me, my son. That's why she says, I'll take that. Because she knew what Hashem, what Jah has spoke to her. She knew, right? And she saw that her husband, in a sense, she's almost like saving her husband here. Right? In a sense, Ribka is saving her husband. Now, when you go through chapter 27 and you come to near the end of the chapter and you begin off chapter 28, note this. In chapter 28, it says, verse 1, And Isaac called Jacob and blessed him and charged him. Whoa, 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 hold on for a moment. He just blessed his son in disguise, Jacob, right, who came in as Esau, right? And he got that blessing of the firstborn. Esau came and, and, and cried like a crybaby. He was like such and such. See, what? See, well, we don't have too much simping. We're not simping for Esau. Because Esau sold his birthright. There's a consequences, right? There's consequences of such an action right there. Because if you understand the relation of the birthright and the blessing, you will understand what was really going on. That's the part that a lot of people, when they read it, they don't put that into context. That this is a part of the culture, the society, and the Bible is giving a testimony in that context. Right? So... She basically, she basically tells him what to do, right? And he goes forward and does what his mother says, right? Yes, he says, I am Esau, thy firstborn. Now, one's going to say, whoa, 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 he lied to his father. According to the scripts, right? Yeah, you could say he did not present the facts. He was there in disguise based on the direction of his matriarch, his mother, speaking to his father who was legally blind, who right now was about to bless the son who covered up the fact that he had sold his birthright. See, that's what that people don't, people, don't, people don't recognize that right there, that Esau has sold his birthright. Right? But let's go on right here. There's more to this, but we're going to get to the main, the main part here. All right? This is an important verse, verse 23 here, Genesis 27, 23. And he discerned him not. He what? He discerned him not. All right? He not car. He did not recognize him. All right? He did not recognize 
that this was the other son, not the other son, because his hands were hairy. They said, well, because his hands were hairy. And it says, as his brother Esau's hands. That's another tell. So he was red, but he was hairy. So he blessed him. Right? So he blessed him. Oh, it's up here. It's this verse right here where he says, the voice is Jacob, verse 22, Genesis 27, 22. And Yaakov went near to Yitzhak, his father, Abiyo, and felt him and said, the voice is Yaakov's voice. The call, the voice is Jacob's voice, but the hands are the hands of Esau. That's important to understand, prophetically speaking. Right? The voice is Jacob's voice, but the hands are the hands of Esau. So don't think that Jacob, Yaakov, or the sons of Jacob can't put in that work. If you overs. Right? They can. But the hands are the hands of Esau. Let's go down here. Then the hand of Jacob is on the heel of Esau. So let's go down here, right here. So now, this is the blessing that Isaac was, that gave to Jacob. Right? And so, right here, when Jacob finally comes, I mean, when, when, when not Jacob, Jacob leaves, he gets his blessing, he's out of there. Right? And then it talks about, um, and it came to pass as soon as Isaac had made an end of blessing Jacob, and Jacob was yet scarce gone. He just was out of his father's presence, the presence of Yitzhak, his father, that Esau, his brother, came in from his hunting. And he also had made savory meat, brought it in to his father. Kind of wonder how much time probably expired, right? And said to his father, let my father rise and eat of his son's venison, that thy soul may bless me. Now in that, in that verse where it says the voice is Jacob's voice, because Jacob called upon Ha'el, Ha'el, the power, right? Ha'el, El, right? Elo, 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 Ha'i, right? He called upon Elo, Heka, he said, because God, in other words, he spoke, he spoke in a way that Esau didn't speak, right? So that's why he said, you know, that, you know, there, it seems as though there, perhaps he had an inclination Right, but it was not fully, you know, he was not fully conscious, he was not fully woke that this was actually the other son. Right, but when he heard Jacob speak in the name of when he says, he says right over here, he says, um, How is it? Remember, he says, How is it that you have gotten this right here? And and Isaac, verse 20, and Yitzhak said to his son, How is it that thou hast found it so quickly, my son? The food, you know, and he said, because Yahweh Loheka, because Jehovah, he who be, be thy power, and Loheka, thy Chayel, thy power, brought it to me. And then he said, Come here, let me feel you. Are you really my son? And he said, He discerned him not, right? So even though he said the voice is Jacob's voice, but the hands are the hands of Esau, why do you say it was the voice of Jacob? Because Jacob spoke in the Hashem. In the name of Jehovah, name of Yahweh, Eloheka, his father's Elohim, his father's power. But even though he said the voice is Jacob's voice, but the hands, the hands of Esau, it says he discerned him not. So he blessed him. Right? And he says, Are you my very son, Esau? And he says, Yes, I am. And then he brought forward the food, so forth and so on. We're scrolling forward here to get to this point right here when Esau comes in, right? Because is the white man really Esau? No, but the white man, so-called white man, right? What we call so-called white man, he's under the dispensation. That means the time allotted according to the prophecy of Esau, right? He's under dispensation and he's also under the curse of Esau. We're going to point out how he is under the curse of Esau, right? And that actually comes out in chapter 28, the connection of the white man, right? Because when we find out who Esau had married, right? It says um, Esau, right? right? When he found out that thou should not take a wife of the daughters of Canaan, Right? It tells us that Esau, 
had already married right Esau was already married we'll get into that right there and who did Esau marry so now this also is yes it's actually in chapter chapter 26 chapter 26 right and Esau was 40 years old when he took to wife Judith the daughter of Beeri the Hittite so he married a daughter of Chet Chet the, the Chitti the Chitti the Kitti the Chitti people that's the link with the Indo-Europeans of modern like Turkey right modern Turkey Indo-Europeans of Turkey and Bashamat the daughter of Elon the Hittite and then it says in verse 35 of chapter 26 that were a grief these daughters were a grief of mine to Isaac so even Isaac was not happy about that though legally blind he was not happy about that and to Ribka so we can see that they were at agreement so even this thing that Rebecca does right here we are sure that Isaac was on board immediately once everything was explained to him but what his son did not explain to him Esau his son did not explain to him so as Esau covered up the fact that he had sold his birthright right we have Jacob you know kind of covering up some things on the behest of his mother now Isaac his father said to him who art thou now now Esau comes forward and he says I am thy son thy firstborn Esau Esau is lying there I he just said I was your firstborn but I sold my I sold my birthright to my brother see but if he said that then he could have still got a second blessing right not the firstborn blessing that he basically got and Isaac trembled very exceedingly now now pops you know Yitzhak is 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 scared because he knows what sort of man Esau is he just likes what Esau kills and captures and 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 cooks up you know what I mean and he likes to eat it you know some ribs give me some of those ribs and he said who he said who me me who 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 who's this where is he that have taken venison and brought it to me and I have eaten of all before thou camest so he's already full he's like you brought me something I'm uh, I, I, you know I already I already had something to eat I mean so wh who you say you are again right and have blessed him yea and he shall be blessed so now you know he must be thinking, wait, wait, wait. I did say that the voice is the voice of Jacob. Because he I asked him how you got it so quickly. And he said, Yahuwah Eloheka. Esau, Esau don't speak in the name of the Hashem. You know, go on. And Esau heard the words of his father and he cried. The word cry right here, I think it's shriek. Yeah, it's Sa'ak. It's Sa'ak. He shrieked. You know, it's like what some people call like the nasty cry, like the cry that when you hear, you start feeling sad, like, oh my gosh. Ah. You know, he shrieked with a great and exceeding bitter cry. Right? Uh, and this is related to the same word, sa'aka, sa'aka. And it's feminine, right? Yeah, noun feminine. So it's very emotional. It was a very emotional cry, right? Very emotional cry, right? One might say he was bitching in a sense, right? And said to his father, bless me, even me also. Oh, I be, oh, my father. And he said, Isaac said, thy brother, Achika, Achika came with subtlety. Mm. What's the word subtlety? Mirma. Mirma. Right? He came with subtlety. Here they have in the BDB, deceit, treachery. Right, deceit, treachery, right? They say guile, so forth and so on. Noun feminine. It's from Rama. Rama means to shoot, to cast, to hurl. Um, the bow shooter, right? He shot bows, right? In that sense, right? So it's from it's from the sense of hurl, the way he threw across his argument. You know, was very convincing, right? Subtlety, and have taken away thy braca. If we're correct, that's one of the things that wisdom, if we're correct, wisdom teaches, you know, wisdom teaches uh, subtlety, right? There's a subtlety. In fact, let's just go here 
would like to do this right here just on this word because a lot of people will zoom in on that word there as to imply because the H 4820 let's go to the H 4820 H 4820 4820 right and we're going to Proverbs let's go to Proverbs let's go to the wisdom books right wisdom books right and let's go over here so deceit it says deceit right deceit it had the word deceit false so was what he did false and deceitful okay the mirma the mirma right there right let's go over here just to check it out i would like to go to the wisdom books because wisdom is the principal thing it says for our getting you know get her get she you get it all right let's go back here let's go back here because sometimes we'll go to the English and it's always not the same words right let's see like we have subtlety here all right this is orma right this is orma now orem from orem right from aram right another kind of shrewd crafty right smoothness so it's another kind of subtlety Right, we could have just done like most people would do and say, see, subtlety, let's go to Proverbs 1 and 4, but it's not the same word. We just want to do due diligence, you know, due diligence right there. All right. So having done due diligence right there. Right. And let's go back. And we could also say that he was acting under the orders of the matriarch. Right. But in the righteous matriarch sense, just note that, right? Remember the prophecy that was shown to her, right? Concerning the two children. So, so that brother came with subtlety and have taken away thy blessing. And then he said, is Esau, Esau now, or he said, he said, one said, and then the next he said, is not he rightly named Yaiko? Is he not rightly named Jacob? For he have supplanted me, right? Akab. You see, Akab? Akab to supplant, to take by the heel, right? Follow at the heel, assail insidiously, overreach, right? The heel grabber, right? The heel grabber. It's almost like you ever fight somebody, like as a child or when you're young or a friend sparring with, and, you know, you're trying to stop them from getting over there, get to the cookie jar. And so you grab them and pull them and hold them back and you'll fall down. And then they're trying to still reach for it and you pull them by the heel. That is Ya'iko. He supplanted me these two times. Wait, hold up. The, how many times? This is the second time, right? He took away my birthright. Now, you see the word he has right here? He says, Lakah. He took away my birthright. Is that how it happened? Is that really how it happened that he took away his birthright like like somebody just take something from you? Or was it that he asked you to sell it and you agreed to the sale for a pot of red lentil pea stew? Okay, what? All right? So you see how even Esau is mischaracterizing what happened here. He took away the plain man, the homebody. You know, not the brother who's out there in them fields, in them streets, but the one who's at home and stuff like that, the more homebody. Not the hunter with his weapons and everything. Not the cunning hunter. Uh, he took you away your birthright. He didn't mention nothing about that, that food. Cause, see, that was the price of his birthright. That, that's what he made the price of his birthright. That food was done. It went in his mouth. It tastes good to his belly and out to the, to the squat. You know what I mean? And it's gone now. All he now is, oh, he took my, he's mispresenting. And behold, now he have taken away my blessing. And he said, hast thou not reserved a blessing for me? Now, this is important to understand the Gentile matrix, you know, with the white man being the face, right, of this dispensation that in the scriptural, biblical eschatology is Esau but Esau himself not being the white man remember that even the white man genetically 
has been proven to come out of the dominant gene, his recessive gene, the black gene. Check. And Isaac answered and said to Esau, Behold, I have made him thy lord. Uh-oh. Have made him thy lord. Have made him thy gabir. It's not the word Adon. Adon like Adoni or Adonai. Here is the word gabir. Gabir. I made him thy gabir. Right, thy Gabir from Gabar, mighty to prevail, powerful, right, to prevail. Notice the, the second entry over there, to be strong, to prevail, to act insol insolently, right, but it can mean to exceed, to confirm, to be great, right. I have blessed him for, for that greatness, right, to be your Gabir, right, because some people see the English Lord and they say, oh, he's the Adon, Adonai, he's the Adoni, no. Is saying he's the Gebir, another kind of one who has mastery. And all his brethren have I given to him for servants. And with corn and wine have I sustained him. And what shall I do now to thee, Bene, my son? And Esau said to his father, as, as I think Hebrew says, with strong crying and prayers and beseeching, Hast thou but one Braca, Abi? Bless me, even me also, O Abi. And Esau lifted up his voice and he wept. And this word baka is a literal word for weeping, shedding tears. He literally was so moved. Big man, hunter, you know, shada. This really, he's beginning now to maybe understand a little bit more that that birthright was worth more than red lentil peas stew right but it's it's already a business it's already a transaction right this is transactional right and isaac his father answered and said to him behold thy dwelling shall be the fatness of the earth and of the dew of heaven from above but here's the key connection of esau right and that dispensation of esau those who move in the dispensation of esau reflect these same biblical scriptural prophetic types and by thy sword shall thou live for us as as bene yisrael right and mesh and meshachim right messiahites what says by our what faith the emuna right but here for them by thy sword but what's our faith based on it's based on the divre elohim the word of chaylehim the power and it says that the word is a sharp two-edged sword, right? In Hebrews, right? The epistle to the Hebrews here, for Esau, for Esau, by thy word, by thy sword, by thy sword, shalt thou live and shall serve thy brother. Note this check. He's supposed to serve his brother. Now note that Esau, when he was 40 years old, according to Genesis, take note, take note, Genesis 26, verse 24, he had married two Canaanitish women, two Hittite women, actually. After this whole incident, right, when we get to chapter 28, he overhears, he sees Isaac blessing Jacob again, right after all this had went on, because no doubt, now he's getting the clarity. He's probably, hey, you know what just happened to his wife? And his wife begins to explain. The matriarch, Ribka, Rebecca, begins to explain to him. And we can already see that at the end of this chapter here. Right? And then he says about not taking, he says, thou should not take a wife of the daughters of Canaan. At the end of this chapter, at the end of this chapter, Ribka says to Isaac, I am weary of my life because of the daughters of Heth, of Chet. The Chitti, the Chitti, Heth is related to the Hittite, though they spell it different in the translation, same one, the daughters of Heth. It's almost like when somebody says, I don't want you to get none of these, I don't want you to get a wife from any of these women out in the street, these, these, these ghetto women or these hood rats. I'm just saying that, not calling nobody no name to be pejorative, but I'm saying that because my prerogative, you know, to bring forward this free speech word sound here to explain and teach. Right? It's like in that sense, don't get no hood rat, don't get no this kind, no gold digger, no this kind of and we know that in certain times, certain places, 
because of whatever the culture, the society, the generation or degeneration of society, a lot of ones will be like in certain styles, fads, frame of mind. You know what I mean? Like people say, that was my generation. Back in my day, we all did this. Back in my day, we all did that. So here in the place that at, the daughters of Heth obviously are those kind of chicks, right? And Rebecca says to Isaac that she's wary of her life because of these kind of daughters, right? You know, one might say ghetto woman or, or hood rat. And I'm not saying that every woman who's a ghetto woman is a bad woman. I'm just saying, just to show this contrast here. If Jacob take a wife of the daughters of Chet, right? And she's saying, as Esau did, right? When he was 40 years old in Genesis chapter 26, verse 24. She says, such as these, the daughters of the land, daughters of the land, right? These neighborhood chicks, these chicks in this neighborhood, you know, you might be living in a certain part of town, because that's just where you're at for the present time. Maybe it was a good neighborhood, a neighborhood change. Maybe there is what they call um, gentrification going on and it's changing up. Or it's like how when the crack epidemic came about, what happened in many neighborhoods that one time had a certain status. And, you know, everybody just got messed up. What happened with the heroin up there in Harlem, but even back in the you know, back in the days, so forth and so on, and it just demoralized that neighborhood. I'm not saying that they had crack or whatever like that, but it's that, it's that moral condition that might just be the neighbor you're living in, but you want to be in the neighborhood, not of the neighborhood, like in the world, not of the world. She says, what good shall my life, what good shall my life do me? That's at the end of the chapter. And then it says in the beginning of the next chapter, chapter 28 of Genesis, and Isaac called Jacob and blessed him and charged him and said to him, thou shall not take a wife of the daughters of Canaan. Wow. So wait, how come Isaac is not saying, how come you made our boy come in there and deceive me and do this to me and so forth and so on? We don't hear none of that or him like feeling like a weight against her because no doubt it was explained. He's about to give the blessing of the firstborn to one who had sold his birthright for something to eat. Jacob might not have even known about that, all right? Because we see in what he said, what, what Esau said, he didn't disclose it truthfully. He said, oh, uh, isn't he rightly named Jacob? He supplanted me these two times. He, he, he took my birthright and he took the blessing. See, even there, Esau is saying that the birthright and the blessing, the birthright and the blessing, the birthright and the blessing go together. It's like, it's like a coin. If you have one side of the coin, then you got to have the other side of the coin. Now, already we're on this video a little bit longer than we had expected right here, here, here. But it's important for us to go through this narrative and show the real link, the real interpretation of this. So that these things that some people then begin to, with a bad eye or evil eye, try to say, oh, the Bible is against this one or that one. You know, like in a sense, like it's against women, it's against men, you know, it's against, you know, you know, all this kind of crazy stuff. Instead of recognizing or taking Esau aside, I find that a lot of ones be defending Esau. When I hear a lot of ones say they believe in the Bible and God and Jesus and everything, they be defending Esau. They be defending Esau bad, 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 bad. And they, and they be lying on Jacob as well. They be lying on Jacob. We're going to go into some proofs of that. But right here, let's look at the blessing that he was given, right? When he finally was given the blessing. Verse 40, Genesis 27, verse 40. We just had to point out that other aspect because when we're looking at Esau here, he's already married. Right. And what's interesting that the book, the Ethiopic book of Jubilees and the book of Jubilees, it discloses how there was a war between the sons of Jacob and the sons of Esau over these very things. It's almost like the enmity that Esau has is going to develop in this chapter 
against his, uh, his, his, his brother Jacob. He wanted to kill his brother. Uh, he wanted to murder his brother. You know, wouldn't that have been easier maybe for Jacob to do? Well, it wasn't in Jacob's spirit. And note that when it gets to that point where Rebecca, she heard this. But then if you read the verse, it says that Esau said these things in his heart. So stop for a moment. If somebody says something in their heart, how is another person going to hear it? And if they really hear what a person says in their heart, like in their mind, and, it, and what they hear the person say in their mind, they know what's in the person's mind, their heart, this must only be by the gift of the Ruach HaKadosh, by the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Truth. All right? So the Holy Spirit, he revealed that to Ribka, to Rebecca. But here, the blessing for Esau, and this is now the end. Remember we had shared where it says that um, Esau is the end of the world? The end of the world is Esau. This is why Esau prophetically is very important. Not just on the carnal, like saying, okay, Esau is the white man, you know, so forth and so on. But there's other family to Esau. Let's put it like that. Like the Canaanites. The Canaanites and Esau are in bed together. Right? The Canaanites, Esau, and Esau and the Hebrew hating. Esau is not a Hebrew. Let me, let me point that out. I, I got to point that out. Esau is not a Hebrew. Esau forsook the Hebrew faith of his patriarchs. Let's point, out, point that out. Esau was more influenced by the faith of his foreign wives. You know what I mean? You remember the Jezebel incident? You know, in that sense, where she had command over a hop? You know, that's the same kind of situation right there. This is why it was so disturbing, right, to Isaac and Rebekah, what Esau done did. So when we were speaking about the blessing that Isaac gives to um, Esau, it's important to understand that this now translates to everyone who is under him. So if Esau, because of this blessing and because of where he come from, Esau would always be the head of the worldly, the seclorum. So this end time, the times of the Gentile. Esau, whether he is the visual head, right, so to speak, he is, 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 is un, in a, how can I say, let me read through the here and you'll see what we're saying by this blessing here, right? The whole world is determined by this prophecy here given to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob by the God of the Trinity, the Hebrew Trinity, the true Trinity, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Coming all the way down to the Moshiach, coming down to I and I. I weep not, behold, the line of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed. To open the book, let's keep on loosening the seven seals. And by thy sword shall thou live, and shall serve thy brother. And it shall come to pass when thou shalt have the dominion. Pause, hold up. Did you read that when it says, and it shall come to pass when thou shall have the dominion. That's an important area not to get into a deep um, um, reasoning on it because it might be a little while just to put it into context where he shall have the dominion. What does that mean? When he shall break, when he shall break the yoke. Let's go right here. Right, gotta get to the Hebrew here, the hard copy Hebrew. Shall have the dominion, right? Thou shall break his yoke from off thy neck. Right? So the blessing that was given to Esau was that by his sword, right, he would live and he would serve his brother. But the prophecy is already there that. There will come a time when you will have the upper hand or the dominion. And when you have the dominion, you will break loose. All right? That's from the Hebrew. You will break loose. You will break loose. So it says that you shall have the dominion. All right? You shall root, wander, wander restlessly, roam. East, west, north, south, or show restlessness. You will ramble free 
Earth or this uh, consulate to tramp, to trot about, right? To be Lord, to mourn, to rule, to have dominion. It's a very, very interesting word, right? Now, in the sense of Esau and that which is connected with Esau. So when Esau married the Canaanites, my daughters, as time went on, he comes to the head of even that people, right? Because of this blessing from, from the patriarch Yitzhak, right? Esau hated, there, there goes his blessing. His blessing is one, two lines. There are two lines of blessing. And it says that Esau hated Jacob because of the blessing. But somehow he doesn't recognize that this is all his own fault. Right? One is his fault because he sold his birthright. Two, he did not make that clearly disclosed to his father. Because if he made that clearly disclosed to his father, he could protest and say, Hey, listen, I sold my birthright to my brother. So I, I cannot take the blessing because the blessing the birthright is connected. He already mentioned the blessing the birthright is connected. Right? He says, first he took my birthright, well, he sold it, and then he took my blessing. Right? But now it says that he hates his brother Jacob. Note the word, he hates that's why the law says, what is the word right here? Satam. Satam sounds like, it's not the other word for hate. There's a couple of words that in translation seem to be a hate, right? Oppose oneself. He is Satam. Not Satan, but Satam, right? Which means to lurk for, to persecute, falsely prosecute, to hate. To oppose self against. See, it's an interesting, Satam is interesting in the Hebrew, to oppose self against. It's like sometimes we as black people say, why? why? And when we study history and we see what the Gentiles, especially the so called white peoples under that, that evil mentality of so called white supremacy, have done, all the kind of crazy laws and other things, call us cattle and, you know, we're animals, but then they would rape us and sleep with us, rape the woman and the men, and do all this crazy stuff. We all be all in the plantation, all in the house, all in the field and everything, but as soon as we demand to have some things for ourselves, since we're past that stage, they would then say that they have no work for us, no employment for us. Right? And then they want to segregate. When we so-called break free, we become free. They want to segregate. But then when we're on the plant station working for free, right? there's all this integration and rape and sexual molestation and abuse that has happened historically. So you have to ask yourself, but then he'll speak all these things like we're so inferior, yet he's having, you know, so-called bastard babies by raping, you know, our mothers, sisters, daughters, wives, right? And also the men too as well, you know? And so you have to ask yourself, wait, how could he call us animals and cattle? So he likes having sex with animals. You know, you have to kind of put that logic together. And we're these chattel, cattle slavery, slaves, we're not really human. You know what I'm saying? Then why is he so desirous to, to fornicate and to adulterate and to defile and do these things to us? So that's a sense of Satan. And Esau, Satan, he opposed himself. Right? Sometimes when you notice so-called white supremacy racism, historically or actively, you say, this is so crazy. It's like he's going against his own self. Not just, it's not even, it's not the usual word for hate. You know, Satam is not the usual word for hate. Check, you can check that out, right? But it goes on, he goes on to say, right? And Esau said in his heart, the days of mourning for my father are at hand. Then will I slay my brother Jacob. Now here's the funny thing. Here's the interesting thing right here. Though Jacob, I mean, though, 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 though Isaac said what he said about like he'll know when he's like when the day of his death is and, you know, he's getting old and everything. When you check the time that Yaakov Jacob was with Laban, his mother's brother, right out there in the seven, seven, like 20 something years before he returns. 
right? And then the two brothers kind of get together. It seems as though some of that hatred had subsided. But what the Ethiopic Book of Jubilees, what Metzhafik Kufale, the book of divisions of the partio, the portions and divisions, what it brings out right there is that that enmity seems to have been um, become like a generational, that generational hatred was transmitted in his children so much so that there was a war between the sons of Esau and the sons of Jacob. In which according to Jubilees, Metzafik Kufale, right, Jacob slew his brother in battle. Right? That's according to Metzafik Kufale, the book of Jubilees. Right, But here he says the days of mourning for my father are at hand But it would be another 20 something years That's all that was to say It would be another 20 something years You know what I'm saying? A little less than 30 years would, would have transpired Right? Between this incident and when Yitzhak Isaac passes And then he says Then will I slay my brother Yaakov this is why when Jacob is coming back from Pandan Aram, when he's coming, returning with his family and, and his, 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 his wives, you know, his woman and wives, the four, and all the children and everything else that they had. Why, when he knew that Esau was up ahead, he sent all these gifts to appease Esau because he's thinking, Jacob is thinking, man, I know my brother was hating me before. And he wanted to kill me when the father was dead. He, he probably going to want to kill me. And, and I got all these children and these women. I'm very vulnerable. Let me try to appease him by sending some gift. But by that time, Esau had subsided somewhat. The man himself. But it's like through his hatred. You know, how does a thing begin? It depends on how sometimes ones are conceived. No doubt a lot of his children that later on become enemies of the sons of Israel. Now they are mixed breed. Right? They're mixed breed right there. And then further we see that Esau, he takes a daughter of Ishmael. So this means that there are a couple of different areas that we find the spiritual um, Edomites. Those who move in the spirit of Edom amongst a few different peoples. And that's inclusive of the white man but not exclusive to the white man as some of the other camps like ISUPK or One West camps may teach and it says and these words of Esau her elder son notice that it says her elder son right her elder son he was the eldest he's still the eldest you know but he don't have that firstborn status because he sold it contractual transactional the words were told to Ribka, Rebecca, and she sent. Now, stop for a moment. This verse says that he said in his heart. You see that there? The next verse said that the words of Esau, her elder son, were told to Ribka. Question, who told it to Ribka? No doubt, it was the Ruach HaKadosh. It was the Holy Spirit. It was Yahweh Hey Hashem, the same John Jehovah or according to the anglicized tetragrammaton, the Lord, right, who told her about these two manner of children, nations in her womb, in her matrix, in her belly, right? So the words are told, even though Esau spoke these words, you know, they say a mother knows her child, her son, her children, her daughter too, but you know, a mother knows her child or her children, but she knew those words. And she sent and called Yaakov, her younger son, and said to him, Behold, thy brother Esau, as touching thee, doth comfort himself, purposing to kill thee. He does what? Comfort, Naham. He's consoling. The Naham here is to console, to be sorry. Same word was his repent, was it like the Lord repent. It actually uses this word like he, he consoled himself. He was moved to pity. Right? You can see the different let's go down here, right here. He sighed, literally Naham. He sighed. Naham. He breathes strongly. Was sorry. Not like I'm sorry, I'm sorry, but was feeling sorry for himself, 
confident. It's going to be all right. Yeah, you did this to me, but yeah, when I kill you, such and such. He's comforting himself, right, with that purpose to kill thee. Now, therefore, my son, obey my voice and arise. Flee thou to Laban, my brother, to Haran. And tie with him. Look what she says, a few days. It would be 20-something years. Until thy brother's fury turn away. Well, this part of her word is true. The brother's fury did turn away, but it seemed to have been degenerated or passed on in Esau's the Edomites. In the Edomites. This is where we get the animosity of the Edomites in the scripture being passed on. And when you recognize that the mothers were all of different other nations, like for example, the Canaanites, the two women, right? The two Hittite women, right? And um, see Phoenician goddess, she knows that she's from that region, and there's other scholarship out there that points out that the so called white, right, peoples, Indo European white peoples, what some might falsely call Aryans or white people, that those are the Canaanites, right? Those are the Canaanites, because remember the black gene, dominant gene, and sometimes produces certain recessive forms, right? And it's interesting that both Canaan was said to be a servant to his brothers, and Esau, Esau was said to be a servant to his brothers. Think about it for a moment. We're using like uh, YouTubes and all the social media platforms to communicate, to do business, a lot of this stuff. And we call these ones and they are service providers. They have built this Western Gentile system. And if you look at it from the divine mind, you can see how they're even fulfilling that prophecy. But there's still that Satan, them opposing themselves. Mm-hmm. So his fury turned away until thy brother's anger turned away from thee, and he forget. This is interesting that the mother, she knows her child, that he's angry now. You know, like you may have relatives or you may be a person like that. You get real angry, but then the people leave you alone for a while. You know, after a while, you, you, you know, you, 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 some people might think you're bipolar. People like this bipolar or something like that. Maybe in a certain sense, there is something there to it, but they will forget it. Right? That which thou hast done to him. And when he meets up with his brother later on in Bereshith, the first book of Moshe, he really seems to forget about it. We can tell from the narrative that Yaakov, Jacob, is very conscious, even self-conscious of that. Maybe even too self-conscious of it. Then I will send and fetch thee from thence. Why should I be deprived also of both? Of you both in one day. Now note this right here. That even though she acted this way. One can say that was. One could say against Esau. It was even in Esau's best interest too. That that happened. Since Esau wasn't man enough to say to his father. That when you bless me. Don't bless me with the firstborn. Bless my brother first. Why? Because I sold my birthright to my bra. To my brother. I mean, there's siblings that sometimes say that, listen, I know I'm the older one, but I listen to you and whatever you say, go. And they kind of might switch roles in a sense because one recognizes the older might recognize that the younger sibling is a wiser sibling. It goes on. It happens. Right. And without all this violence or attempted <laughs> attempted violence, but it's a deeper purpose going on in the Esau Jacob type. 46. And Rivka said, notice, she said to Isaac. So first she spoke to Jacob. And then she spoke to Isaac. And even when she speaks about Esau, you could tell that she loves you know, there's a love she has for, for that being her son. She don't want to lose him either, either. Now, note this. It's Esau that's thinking to kill Jacob. But she says, lest I be deprived of both of you both in one day. Because if Esau probably tried anything against Jacob, mama going to do something. Right? Mama going to do something. Something going to be done did to you. Right? Now she turns to her husband who was in the beginning of the chapter legally blind, but we're going to see by the time we go to the next chapter, or you go to the next chapter, chapter 28 of Genesis, you're going to see 
where he got his sight back because he blesses Jacob again. And he commands Jacob something. He commands Jacob something about thou shall not take a wife of the daughters of Canaan. And then it says in verse 8 of chapter, the next chapter, it says, And Esau saw that the daughters of Canaan pleased not Isaac his father. No, it didn't say that it pleased not Isaac his father or his mother. We know that it didn't please both of them. But we can tell that he is a little more partial to his father because his father was more partial to him because of the food that he ate at his son's hand. Now, to make decisions off of that basis is definitely a kind of a carnal inclination, right? But the chosen people are the chosen people. Even when they are in their rebellion, they are still regarded as the people God chose. But because of that chosen status, they will now have to, you know, pay the price. You do the crime, you do the time. 400 years, right? So here, Ribka said to Isaac, I am weary of my life. I read this before, but just to go through this, because of the daughters of Heth. Now, daughter of Heth is one of the 11 sons of Canaan, of Canaan. If Jacob take a wife of the daughters of Heth, like we know that in the 40th year of Esau's life, which of course would be the 40th year when, when, when Isaac, you know, when, when, when Jacob was 40, Right when Jacob was forty, Esau was forty. But Scripture tells us that in the fortieth year of Esau's life, he took to wife um, two Hittite women, right, who were daughters of Heth. So here is the word that Ribka says to Isaac: If Jacob take a wife, a Esha, Eshet, the Oset, right, Esha, right, of the daughters of Heth. Such as these, which are the daughters of the land, what good shall my life do me? Now, it's powerful when we come to the chapters that like kind of sum up with a question. Or even like the book of Jonah that sums up with a question. You know what I mean? You know, the question verses. Because they allow I and I, they allow us, you know, to reflect and to meditate on, well, what's the question? What's the matter? What is being questioned right here? Right? She's asking that. You know, that this does not happen because there'll be no good. My life would be a waste. The prophecy, what Yahweh has said to I, is, is going to be all in vain. Next chapter, so you can see it for yourself. And Isaac called Jacob and blessed him and charged him and said to him. Now, note this. Isaac, many are called, right? If you are chosen, well, Isaac called Jacob and blessed him, blessed Jacob, and charged him. Charged him means sawa. Sawa, some say Sawa, modern Hebrew, ancient pointing, Sawa. He commanded him. He gave his son a command. So remember this, that there are the commandments, the ten words, Esorat Sadibari, and for keeping that, there's Braka, Berko, there are blessing. So this blessing, my him, is connected with the commandment. It's like two sides of a coin, right? It's like a contractual transactional agreement. You know, if you do such and such, then such and such will give you such and such. But if you don't do such and such, you're going to have to then pay such and such or whatever's going to be the consequence. And said to him, thou shall not take a wife of the daughters of Canaan. Now, the real Indo-European, I like to put it in this sentence of just saying white in that kind of pseudo sense right there. But the Indo-European, right, the progenitor of the so-called white peoples of today. Right, come from Canaan. We have proven this, we have the evidence, and then we've come across others, right, who are even white European peoples from them regions of the world. And when we start to study their facts, their evidence connected with the facts and the evidence that we got and that others have shared with us, we see that it just it just compounds it with more and more evidence, with more and more receipts, so to speak. Right. See, now I know today they this is one reason why this pseudo scholarship and archaeologists and nowadays a lot of the consensus of scholarship try to say that the Israelites are Canaanites. This is why they try to say that the Israelites are Canaanites. That's the reason why they say that. See, note that they said that the black man is 
is is black and go through what they went through over the 400 years because of the curse of Ham. And in the Bible, there's no curse on Ham. In the ninth chapter of Genesis, it talk about the curse on Canaan. You notice how white supremacy sidestepped that completely. It was like a guilty conscience. Why didn't they say that we're black people in the situation, black and everything because of the curse on Canaan? They could have said that. But instead, they go to the father and say the curse on Ham, and there was no curse on Ham, on Kam, or one might say Kemet. There was no curse on them. Why did he sidestep that? You see the three card Monty, the card shuffle that he did right there with that? See, it would have been obvious, and this shows something wrong with white people at that time who were so Bible, Puritan, you know, into all of these kind of um, fanatical forms of whitewashed Christianity. But they were all about reading the Bible. And then when they was told, don't worry about those so-called Negroes, those N-words, because they are in the situation because of the curse of Ham. And it's in the Bible. It's amazing that none of them looked at the Bible and said, wait, there's no curse on Ham in the Bible. It says the curse of Canaan. But if they were to say the curse of Canaan, they couldn't say that because they really knew who they were. Right, those of them knew who they were. This is why they flipped it, right? And this is why today, in the latter day um, pseudo scholarship, a lot of these Bible people and so called scholars and university types writing all these papers trying to say, Oh, the Israelites are Canaanites, and, and Hebrew is Canaanite, and this is Canaanite, everything is Canaanite, the Canaanite, 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 because it's a last ditch effort, right, for them to do some of new world order kind of thing because that old world 1776 is coming to the end because remember the end is Esau so white man is connected with Esau right especially spiritually connected with Esau right but also when we look at the DNA right and the genetics you know what I mean with Canaan connection as well as of Ishmael connection, right? Then we can understand more about who's who on this earthly plane today, right? So he was told to go to Pandanaram, the house of Bethuel, thy mother's father, and take thee a wife from thence, from the daughters of Laban, thy mother's brother, right? And we know that sometimes parents will be like, oh, um, I don't, I don't want you to, you know, marry or date these kind of girls, right? Because they might see a different morality or immorality in them. And El Shaddai, bless thee, right? Note this right here. In the, this is the real blessing. This is, well, the other one's a real blessing. Don't get me wrong. But this is, this caps it off. This seals it up. Right? This is like the double tap. This is the second of the double tap as far as the baraka, the blessing goes. He says, And El Shaddai bless thee, I, and make thee fruitful and multiply thee, I, that thou, that the I mayest be a multitude of people. Right? And we can see that even that part of the blessing, he leaves alone. Jacob crossed over and tried it all the way up to Pandanaram. He tried it all the way up there, right, to Syria, Syria, that region of the world, by himself, right? He was alone. All he had was his, his rod, as the scriptures say. He tried it by himself. But when he came back, he had enough, enough ones, right? He had enough ones. He went, he wanted Rachel, right, got Leah, right, and then each one of them had a handmaid. Then the sisters in their back and forth gave their handmaids to be his wife, and he had, you know, those 13 children. Mm-hmm. 12 tribes, 13 children, right? So that word right there, and may us be a multitude of people, verse 4, and give thee the bracha of Abraham. Now note that right there. Beyond the blessing just of the father. Remember, the father had his blessing. That's what was given with the venison, right? You say his soul blessing, his blessing, right? Then here, he now puts El Shaddai, El Shaddai, the almighty supply, 
the almighty supply, El Shaddai, the almighty nurturer. He put that blessing right, on him by putting the Hashem of he who be who he be as El Hayo Power Shaddai. Right? He put that on Jacob. Right? And then he said the words, make thee fruitful and multiply thee. That thou mayest be a multitude, enough, enough people. And then he goes on in the next verse to say, for first, and give thee the baraka, the blessing, right? The baraka, give thee the baraka, the blessing of Abraham to thee, to thee, Jacob, and to thy seed, to your race, to your progeny, with thee. That's the key, with thee, that thou mayest inherit the land wherein thou art a stranger. So yes, we went into other land, historically speaking, but the earth is Yahweh, hey, is Jehovah, is the fullness thereof. Here it says, which God, right, which El, right, Elohim, Chaylehim, the power, gave to Abraham. So here is where he passes on the true Hebrew Braca. That's why we say that Esau, right, is a descendant from Abraham, but he's not truly a Hebrew in spirit and in truth. He's still on the carnal mind. He was on the carnal mind, the fleshy mind, the natural mind. Another key about white supremacy in this, in this corrupt world order today, right? You can see the Esau spirit is guiding it or misguiding and misdirecting it. And Yitzhak sent away Yaakov and he went to Pandan Aram, right, to Laban, son of Betuel, the Syrian, brother of Rivka, Jacob, and Esau's mother. There's another part that people often miss over, that if Esau at the age of 40 didn't go out there and get two wives, right, no doubt both of them would have gone out to Pandan Aram, and no doubt Leah, the elder, would have married Esau, and the younger, Rebecca, I mean, um, the younger, Slika, the younger, um, 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 Rachel, Rachel, would have married Yaiko. But here, this, note this verse, and Esau saw that Isaac had blessed Jacob and sent him away to Pandanaram. Look, 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 look. Didn't he already bless him and Esau didn't see that blessing? So we have three blessings here. Right? We have three blessings here. Right? We have the one in the previous chapter. Right? And we have these two here. He received the blessing of El Shaddai. And then he received that Baraka, the blessing of Abraham. And therefore he would be that firstborn. So now he's getting that firstborn. This is really the real fullness of the firstborn blessing. Remember, man is a trinity. Man has spirit, soul, and body. Right? Note right here, here, here. Right? From, we could say, Jacob received that blessing, right, from his father because of the birthright and because of the disguise. But the disguise was only necessary because the elder brother was hiding and misrepresenting the facts of the case. And we're going to see right over here what Esau does. Now Esau saw that Isaac had blessed Jacob. Now this is not the other blessing in the previous chapter. So now you have to ask yourself, well, after all this went on in the previous chapter and you say deception or it was covered up or he was hiding or he said this and that, you know, Jacob and everything, wouldn't you think that the father would have a different attitude? Right? But here he seems to be on the same side as Ribka. Because Ribka, her, her sight wasn't, wasn't dim. She could see. And plus the prophecy, what the prophet I see, what the prophet see, she had that prophecy. We can even say that she is like a prophetess, right, in the true Hebrew sense right here, right? That's what faith without works. So that work that she did, however it might seem to the natural man, the natural, the carnal, the fleshy mind, right, it was right in the divine eyes. Right? And when Esau saw that Isaac had blessed Jacob and sent him away to Pandanaram to take him away from thence, and that he blessed him, 
Not, notice how many times it says blessed here in this one verse, Genesis 28 and 6. It begins off saying that Esau saw that Isaac had blessed Jacob and sent him away to take a wife from, from like Pananaram, from there. And then it says, and that he blessed him. Right? He, he gave him a charge, a command. That when he blessed him, he gave him a commandment. You want to know about the different levels of blessing? Here, Yaakob is getting the fullness of the blessing. And he blessed him and gave him a command, a charge, saying, Thou shalt not take a wife of the daughters of the Kana'an, the Kana'anu Anu. And Jacob obeyed. You see that word obeyed? And Jacob obeyed his father and his mother and was gone to Pandan Aram. So what do we recognize here? We recognize that Esau, right, that natural man, is beginning to see something. He see that the daughters of Canaan please not Yitzhak, Isaac, Abiyo, Yitzhak, Abiv, right? His his father, please not his father, right? But note in the narrative it says that Jacob obeyed his father and his mother. So the father and his mother. After all that went on, after Rivka's, Rebecca's part, that part must have been disclosed to, to Isaac later on. They all may have had a good laugh about it. After all, the name Yitzhak, Isaac means to laugh. Right? The seed shall be called in Yitzhak. Ones may have rumor, but we got humor. What more can we say about it? Right? As Burhana Salasi, a.k.a. Robert Nesta Marley, better known as Bob Marley, said they got rumor, we got humor. Right? But look what Esau is seeing. Esau seeing this, what does he do? It says, then, once he saw this scene, notice the importance of sight. Remember, Isaac was, right, his, he could not see, right, legally blind, Torah blind, the direct instruction blind. Right? Then went Esau, Esau to Ishmael. He went to Ishmael. Why? Because Ishmael seemed to be very close to Abraham after that was Abraham, the firstborn son. You get it? Check. Check. Are you checking this? And took to the wives which he had. So he already had two wives. He took Mahalath, the daughter of Ishmael, Abraham's son, the sister of Nabayot, to be his wife. So he's probably thinking, oh man. Maybe me getting those women, that maybe that's the reason why. You know, such and such. But regardless of what he's thinking, he saw that that did not please his father, and he went out and acted. So you can see faith, right? Whether it's in one like Esau or whether it's in one like Jacob. Everybody has faith. Whatever one really admits is true, right? It governs and it guides them, or at least it should. He saw this concerning what pleased his father, and so that it did not please his father, right? He went and tried to remedy it, right? And then it says, And Jacob went out from Beersheba and went toward Haran, right? So then we go into another part of the narrative right there, there, there. All right, this is, this is a, one of the longer ones, but people, people tell me how, how, you know, if you like us to really go and get into the fullness of this let's let's first of all go go here and let's touch on this one more time the apocryphal esau and jacob beginning this was the key words research and he said to me from abraham to yitzhak when jacob and esau were born of him jacob yaakov's hand his yad his hand held first the heel of esau for Esau, Esau is the end of the world, the end of the seclorum. They talk about Nuvo Ordo seclorum, but no, it's the end of this seclorum. And Yaakov, Jacob, is the beginning of it that followeth. So in a sense, we've been in Esau's time all this time. That the kingdom, the kingdom of heaven, connected with Jacob is the beginning. The hand of man is betwixt the heel and the hand. Other question, Estrus, ask thou not. So really, there's no other question we really need to understand. 
right that this world system you might think is only run by so-called white people right or by the anglo-americans they are truly on the overt at the top of it but there are other peoples right that agree with them of various different nationalities various different ethnicity this is why I and I as Rastafari say you know we say um, Nayabingi Ayabingi say death to black and white down presser they say death to black or white evil doer all right it, it doesn't matter okay because he's black and he did the evil you're gonna make excuses for him that's not righteousness whether black people who think like that are not truly of Jah's chosen people that you're just gonna agree with them because they are black and they are wrong and they are you know, you know what I'm saying because you you can't be in the covenant with El Shaddai if you are then you would know that is that is that is wrong there so Esau is not the white man in other words when Esau and Jacob was born it's not like one was white and one was black in that sense right in that so-called sense I know the albino element has been added and we can see that right there but when we look at the linguistics of the language to describe an albino baby right we would not use a term that would be translated as red the only one that thinks that is counterfeit Christianity whitewash white Anglo-Saxon Protestant counterfeit Christianity so I would not say that well the one West camps and the ISUPK once they stop lying and we mentioned this at the outset right there is a truth that the white man or the or the, the anglo-american the gentiles right the spirit of esau is what's governing and no doubt the blood type of esau is also there but esau was a whore in the sense of like if a whore is like you just have a bunch of you know like the way he did his thing and he had a lot of mongrels I'm going to say mongrels because people don't think I'm talking about particular kind of people, but there's a lot of intermixture of these same ones. So you ever wonder why, like, for example, we had the Arab, so-called Arab, especially the pale, white, red, so-called Arab slave trade, right? And then we had the so-called white man and his counterfeit Christian slave trade. Note that. And we find that the victims of both of those tend to be the same peoples mainly we could say the Hebrews or the Israelitish people black and Israelitish Hebrew Israelite people the victims right and not just West Africa but there's also incursions that went on in East Africa this is one of the significance of the Israelites of Ethiopia right so there's more to actually get into right here we didn't just go into some of the word you know like the word like 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 breaking down the whole Esau he was called Esau right and he was described as being red but then he was called Adam right because of that red porridge but mainly not just because of red porridge yes but also because he sold his birthright for something to eat he sold his birthright for like a like a temporary almost like a temporary high you know a quick temporary high there's some other kind of crazy foolish thing here's where if this is accurate where they're trying to say the eight man from Africa and they're trying to say well this is Esau positively most human of all creatures yet bought from the forest Esau does all that we do you can see that this was some kind of like racist kind of a thing like one of the old racists the white supremacists trying to throw things around right right there so anyway just blowing the trump on this this is also interesting but this is now getting into another area okay here 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 All right now here they mislabel things they say that's the Canaanite head right actually that's more of one of the Israelite types this over here is one of the more Israelite types right the Israelite types you can see the beard the nose so forth and so on what they try to do is whitewash it so forth and so on you could tell that both of these two ones don't have the same phenotype right I mean look at the look at the forehead 
right? The angle is, is not the same. Yes, the nose might seem a little bit like that, but I know many ones and ones within my own family of black, brown people over here in America, you know, dark skinned people, reddish brown skinned people, you know, some of them light skinned people that have these sort of phenotypes. But here is where he likes to mislabel it. Notice when they have the ancient Hittite type. So that's more accurate, right? The ancient Hittite type. You can see which one bears a resemblance. Remember the Canaanite? What we've been saying about the Canaanite type? But the Canaanite over there is mislabeled. Is mislabeled. That should actually be the Hebrew type. But here it says, Then these became the Babylonian Jews. Then many of the people of the land became Jews. Right? In other words, became converts to the culture the cultural, spirituality, religion, way of life. It's almost like to say when we talk about Rastafari, Rastafari from its root, right, is connected with the Israelites of Ethiopia, right, and black people, but there are other peoples, right, who are Rasta or Rastafari are influenced in the same sense in ancient Egypt, right, although Abram, Ha'ibri, Abraham is the Hebrew, Right? And the righteous of his seed are also Hebrew. There were other ones who came into that spirituality faith. You know, sometimes where one spirituality faith is like a way of life for us, but for others it becomes like a kind of a culture. But that culture is probably also better than what they had prior to their encounter with us. So the same thing occurred out in Babylon. But at the same time, there were Babylonian Yehudi who were of our people, even the Ezra's and the Nehemiah's, Nehemiah, that returned. Although these are called Jews, a term which is derived from the word Yehuda, right? These people are not true Judahites, but became a mix and a hybridized people. Now, in what we've been saying about Esau and both touching on the blessing, because these two things are all connected. It seems like a lot of things are also predicated not just on Esau's action of selling his birthright, but becomes compounded on the 40th, the 40th year when he married into the Hittites, right? the children, the daughters of Chet. Right? And then later on, after he heard the command, the charge that his brother was given when he was blessed twice again. So in total, Jacob was blessed three times. Right? He went, Esau went and married one of the daughters of the Ishmaelites. So this right here, at least what's written here and, and highlighted here, is true. These people are not the true Judahites of that particular seed, but became a mix of hybridized people. So were the Edomites. The Edomites were a hybridized people. Right? Some say you are what your mother is. You hear some people say you're a Jew if your mother's a Jew. Well then let's apply that here with Esau. What are the Edomites? Right? We must recognize that the hand that rocks the cradle rules the world. Have you not heard? The hand that rocks the cradle rules the world. These people are not true Judahites, but became mixed of hybridized people consisting of Edomites. Hittites, Canaanites, right? Judahites, some Judahites married into them, some Babylonians, Ishmaelites, Huns, and Khazars. So you see this right here for yourself. Connect this with what we have touched on and referenced in Bereshith, in Genesis. When they migrated to other lands throughout the centuries, they retained their, quote, Jew or Judahite identity, but brought with them the religion of Babylon. Well, I'll say they brought with them the non-Hebrew, the non-Hebrew spiritualities. It's almost like a poltergeist, right? But yes, under sometimes under, you know, a pseudonym, right? Here it says the Jews bear the features of the races of Esau intermixed with. So they're trying to say that the Canaanite head over there. But we showed you some of the what you call them. We'll show you it again. We're gonna pick up on this, but we're just gonna seal up right here because of the well you say the european jews right mixed ancestry 
history is sketchy as to their origin from Japheth, Esau, or other people in the Bible. Well, by study, we can see the Ashkenaz connection with Gomer, that's connecting with Japheth. We see the Esau connection with the Canaanites, right? And it says that Japheth shall dwell in the tents of Shem, right? And Esau can be considered to be a Semite, though Esau was not a Hebrew, right? Esau was not a Hebrew. I know a lot of people are teaching that, but they don't understand what the term Hebrew truly means, right? But here, 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 just this exhibit as well. All right, we'll get into a little bit more of that. And yeah, so the Jew in truth, right? Like the Jew, uh, Negro, right? Being a study of the Jewish ancestry from an impartial standpoint. And even many of the, um, you know, um, European Jews, especially in the intermixture in some place in Europe, there was a strong black presence in Europe right over the years both blacks that would have ascribed to Christianity or the Christian teaching where we have the icons being black people and even black people in Europe who ascribe to the Hebrew or the Judaic ancestry of which we have say a Sephardic link on the Spanish side you know Spanish speaking side of it as well Right, and then when we notice these admixtures today and family structures and links, we can see ain't nothing new under the sun. So, right here, 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 this is what be King David, right here, from some ancient paintings and stuff like that. And you can see that we like to call it that royal order of the Ethiopian Hebrew likeness right there so anyway brothers and sisters gonna seal up right here 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 no we're gonna have to revisit this with some further documentation but just as a basic a basic right here that the so-called white man is not Esau but the white man is related to Esau the white man at least the the, the world system is being run by the spirit of Esau and the Edomites is a mixed hybrid and so wherever Esau is because of who he's descended from right he would be according to the prophecy and world history in charge so even Rome from a Judaic perspective was referred to as Esau this is why the Kevr Neges in speaking of um, the king of Rome and the king of Ethiopia that right there is just bringing out the Esau Rome, Ethiopia, Israel connection. Yes, I. Rastafari. So here, here, here. Check the description. Check us out. LOJS.org. Get a copy. We have the reprint of the Ethiopic Book of Jubilees. Also, as well, the Ethiopic Book of Enoch. And we have an additional publication where we have the actual script from which the translator, R.H. Charles, translates. So we have the translation with the footnotes. Then there's also the actual script script, the Gutas, the ancient Semitic, Shemitic script as a point of reference for the Talmudim. That's the word for disciples and the scholars. Shalom Chabarim. Shalom, shalom brothers and sisters and give thanks. Please like, share, subscribe, also save, you know, for a future point of reference. Give thanks.